Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion number 12623 in the name of John Swinney on the Local Government Finance Scotland Amendment Order 2015. Could I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on John Swinney to speak to and move the motion. Deputy First Minister, eight minutes maximum as we are short of time. Presiding officer. On the 5th of February, Parliament approved the Local Government France Scotland Order 2015. This enabled Scotland's local authorities to set their revenue budgets for the forthcoming financial year. The Scottish Government has treated local government fairly in providing a, de a degree of protection in very difficult economic circumstances. And with the approval of this amendment order before us today, this will confirm total funding for this year of £10.8 billion. And with extra money for new responsibilities, the total funding for next year will increase to over £10.85 billion. It is worth comparing the 2015-16 position with the comparable position this time last year. When we debated the 2014 amendment order, the total funding package for 2014-15 was confirmed as £10.6 billion. Taking into account the impact of the capital funding reprofiling, this represents an increase following the allocation of additional monies for new responsibilities, including expansion of early years childcare and free school meals provision, of over £250 million, or 2.4%. In return for this degree of protection, I believe it is only fair and reasonable to ask local government to give specific commitments in return. In setting their budgets for next year, local authorities were asked that in return for this increased level of funding, they should freeze their council tax levels for an eighth consecutive year and maintain each individual council's teacher numbers at 2014-15 levels maintain each individual council's teacher-pupil ratio again at 2014-15 levels and secure places for all probationer teachers who require one. I'm delighted to say that all 32 councils have budgeted to fulfil all of these commitments in 2015-16, both the continuation of the council tax freeze and the educational commitments at 2014-15 levels. On the council tax freeze, the Scottish Government has put into place the resources required to uh, freeze the uh, council tax as part of the overall cash settlement of local government and then gone beyond that with extra money for new responsibilities. This is a fair settlement at a time of almost zero inflation and when local authorities are expected to achieve annual efficiency savings of 3% per annum, which they are able to retain and to reinvest. We have, of course, provided £70 million to recompense councils for freezing their council tax levels under the current, Scottish financial con the current financial constraints facing the Scottish budgets, uh, I believe this represents a fair and a reasonable settlement. The continuation of the council tax freeze for an eighth year will be particularly welcome, for, uh, welcome news for hard-pressed council tax paying households across the country. On the teacher numbers position, the Scottish Government believed it was necessary to take action to protect teacher numbers. The publication in December 2014 of the teacher census showed that teacher numbers had not been maintained, despite the previous agreement between the Government and local authorities for this to be the case. I accept that the Government's approach was not universally welcomed by all local authorities, but believe it, we believe it was the right thing to do to safeguard the number of teaching posts across Scotland in 2015-16. We have agreed also to provide a further £10 million on top of the £41 million already included in the 2015-16 figures in this amendment order, to further support councils in delivering the teachers' commitment. The £10 million is not included today, but following confirmation that the teachers' commitments have been met, I will add this money to the 2015-16 funding allocations in the main order for 2016. In view of the 2015-16 budget process having been concluded, this amendment order seeks approval to the payment of each local authority's share of the £70 million set aside to compensate councils for the council tax income foregone as a result of the continued council tax freeze. Today's amendment order is also seeking parliamentary approval for the distribution of over £26 million, which represents the initial 80% allocation of the discretionary housing payments funding for next year. This arrangement of distributing the majority of the funding until such time as more up-to-date information be becomes available has been agreed with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities. By holding back 20 per cent uh, at this stage, this will ensure the Government's commitment to fully mitigate the impact of the bedroom tax can be achieved. Following my announcement as part of the 2015-16 Budget Bill Stage 3 debate that I intended to invest £11 million to match the poundage cap for business rates south of the border, 
This has required me to increase the general revenue grant by this £11 million and correspondingly reduce the distributable non-domestic rate income total by the same amount. Uh, these changes are already included in today's amendment order. There is one other small change included in this amendment order, uh, the transfer of £2.254 million for the Business Gateway Marketing Project. It was previously paid to Renfrewshire Council, who then forwarded it on to COSLA, but following the decision of Renfrewshire Council to uh, cease membership of COSLA, the responsibility for administering this sum has transferred to Dundee City Council. Taken together, these changes will add almost over £107 million to the amount of general revenue grant we will be distributing to local authorities next year, over and above the sums included in the original 2015 order. As mentioned above, the distributable non-domestic rate income will reduce by £11 million, a net overall increase of £96 million. This confirms that the total revenue funding in 2015-16 will be almost £10 billion and the overall total funding, including capital, will be over £10.85 billion. Presiding officer, I would like to take this opportunity to make two further adjustments to the 2014-15 revenue funding allocations since the 2015 order was approved on 5 February. The first change is the addition of £6.5 million to support local government's contribution to the early implementation of the Developing the Young Workforce Scotland's Youth Employment Strategy, which arises out of the uh, work of Serene Wood on the Wood Commission. The second very small change will add £90,000 to the City of Edinburgh's Council as part of the City's Alliance initiative. These changes add a further £6.6 .6 million to the revenue figures for 2014-15 giving a total of £9.9 .9 billion and an overall total including capital of almost £10.8 billion. In summary, the approval of this amendment order will authorise the distribution of a, further, of a further over £96 million for 2015-16 and a further £6.6 .6 million for this year to local government to support the essential services our local authorities deliver for our communities. The approval of this amendment order today is vital as the funding included in it has already been taken into account by local authorities in setting their 2015-16 budgets. The loss of more than £100 million in funding would have serious consequences for all local authorities, the communities they serve and the people of Scotland who rely on these vital services. Presiding officer, the distribution of funding set out in this amendment order is essential to enable Scotland's local authorities to implement their approved budgets and on that basis I move that Parliament agrees to the Local Government Finance Scotland Order 2015. Many thanks. And I now call on Alec Crowley. Six minutes maximum, please. President officer, thank you. Um, and um, Labour will, Scottish Labour will support the, the, the motion put forward by the Deputy First Minister. Um, if I could pick up on, on a few points that the Deputy First Minister talked about. He talked about um, the teacher numbers and teacher pupil ratio. Um, and I think you know, what was coming across clear at the time when Mr Swinney broke off his negotiations with COSLA was that the majority of local authorities, certainly that I spoke to, um, were not for um, reducing the numbers of teachers that they had. But there are some real difficulties in terms of being able to provide teachers. This morning, for example, I talked to Fife Council. The Fife, when the last, when the last um, teacher number ratio was conducted, survey was conducted, Fife was 83 teachers short. That was not because they were not wanting to fund 83 teachers. It was because they were not able to recruit. 83 teachers and I did raise this with the Deputy uh, First Minister previously. In Fife, Fife yesterday, they're advertising for this August, closed yesterday and they were some 20% down on applicants from last year. They have a major problem in terms of recruitment. The, the education officials that I spoke to in Fife this morning tell me that it's not just a Fife problem, it's a problem increasingly that, that all 32 Scottish local authorities are actually facing. And I would ask the Deputy First Minister to take this point up and actually have a look at it, because it's fine saying that, that he's imposing, or he will impose financial sanctions on authorities that don't meet these numbers, but if they're not able to recruit the teachers, then we certainly will have a problem. In Fife's case, they, have, they are talking to the General Teaching Council and they are looking at um, a major advertising campaign which they're launching for the first time ever. They've, they've um, went out again 
to recruit and they have opened up the recruitment to try and recruit. They tell me that there is a major problem in primary school teachers. There is also a major problem in terms of the STEM uh, subjects. Um, you know, trying to recruit English and maths, drama, biology, chemistry. There are major issues there. So, so the Scottish Government, I would suggest, cannot simply say you will provide or we will cut your numbers if the teachers are not coming through. I understand that there are there is an increase this year in the number of probationary teachers coming through. But I do say the Scottish Government can't ignore what I'm saying to you today, and I would ask an assurance that, that you take that on board and look at it. In terms of the, the settlement itself, we are seeing this year again a real terms cash cut um, in terms of the, the funding that's going to local government. Mr Swinney says that he is fully funding the council tax freeze. Um, local authorities would beg to differ and would argue that, that there is some like 10 million short, it should be up to over 80 million that would be going in this year. However, um, Mr Swinney would say that, that your own budget is cut by 10 per cent and that that, that has been passed on. Um, some authorities are taking substantial cuts. Edinburgh, for example, 20 per cent, Renfrew, 17 per cent. So some authorities are taking larger cuts than, than other authorities. And I think that needs to be recognised. And whilst it may, under the present circumstances, seem like a reasonable settlement, get settlement given where the governments are, and I didn't really want to, to get into an argument that it is or it's not, what I would say, and I think what, what has been acknowledged previously, is that local authorities will find this year very, very difficult. And as they go forward, they find it more difficult. Because what these settlements fa fail to take on board is the level of demand that is increasing for services like health and social care. Um, there is a major demand um, in those types of services, um, and, and as that demand grows, budgets are falling, so local authorities are finding it very difficult. And we will see this year cuts in frontline services right across Scotland. So, you know, I would, I would say that local authorities are finding it very difficult, but under those circumstances, they are working very hard. I do think that we need to look at the community planning partnerships and actually look at how those partnerships are delivering. Because as we see, the, the demographics tell us that, that people are, are living longer, the, the, the demand on health and social care services. We also see in local authorities that the number of children being taken into care is, is actually on the increase, and that's adding massive pressure to the budgets on local authorities. So a strategy that looks at the underlying root causes of poverty, um, and we start to address these issues back, I suppose, to the Christie report. And the Christie report was, was hailed as being the way forward for public services in Scotland. I'm not sure to the extent that we're actually delivering on that. And in the brief time that, that I've got, one other issue I would like to raise with the Deputy um, First Minister is that local authorities across Scotland fund um, the care home services. They buy the places within the care homes. You must draw to um, close, please. It's an area that I would like to see us focus on in terms of the living wage. What is a care worker worth? And in the private sector, the majority of workers are paid uh, the, the, the minimum wage, and we need to address that. Thank you. I call on Cameron Buchanan. Maximum four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It is welcome that this amendment order regarding the money to be distributed to local government is before Parliament. As I have said before, it is important that local government finance orders are kept transparent and open to scrutiny, especially when local authorities across Scotland are facing significant financial difficulties. Only this week, the Accounts Commission published their report detailing local authorities' financial positions at present and going forward. In summary, the report makes it very clear that councils are facing unprecedented pressure on their budgets. In this context, the standoff we've seen over teachers' numbers in the lead to this debate, I think, has set a worrying precedent over central government's intervention. The Accounts Commission report, an overview of local government in Scotland, 2015, highlighted the serious financial difficulties facing councils across Scotland. It rightly cites a number of reasons for the strain on councils' finances, including demographic trends and the challenge of establishing effective health and social care partnerships. 
In addition, it is suggested that councils reform so that they provide more responsive and efficient service that suits local needs and is financially sustainable. In the local government finance amendment order, the Scottish Government said they have consulted with such associations and local authorities that appear to them to be appropriate. I would like to uh, ask what, what this actually means. What do they call appropriate? What is appropriate? And I'm sure that the, the Deputy First Minister will answer that. In addition, it is suggested that councils reform so that they provide a more responsive and efficient service that suits local needs and is financially sustainable. But a key pressure point is also highlighted in the burden that is put on councils to deliver national policies. The clear message to be taken from this is that every penny matters to local councils, and they must be allowed the freedom and flexibility to deliver local services in a manner that is sustainable. This message, providing officer, has clearly not been reflected in the Scottish Government's behaviour in the lead to, up to today's amendment order. I think it is all very well to say that the full amount of money is available to councils will be paid out by this amendment order. But this masks how it has come to this so-called agreement. In no uncertain terms, the Scottish Government stated that they would take money away from any council that did not agree to implement their targets on teacher numbers. So councils either had the choice which is like a Hobson's choice, of either losing out on millions of valuable funding or surrendering their autonomy. It's not surprising, given their financial difficulties, that all councils felt compelled to agree to the government's demands. The point here is not about relative merits of higher or lower teacher numbers. I'm sure we all wish to see standards of education improve across the board, but rather about flexibility and economy in local government, which I recall debating in this very chamber only recently. As the Accounts Commission's report highlighted, councils should respond to increasing pressure on their services by adopting, by adopting flexible, responsible approaches that engage extensively with local communities to determine how best outcomes can be achieved consistently. In other words, central government should not force rigid targets upon them. Rather than being faced with unaffordable demands, councils and their local communities need to be empowered. This takes me to the Community Empowerment Bill. Members will be aware that it's, the bill is at stage two and I've been seeking to ensure that it actually empowers communities realistically. I remain concerned that, as it stands, the bill would empower, community, empower communities only in name and not really in practice. In the interest of time, I will not go over the changes that I've sought, but I will say that it is crucial for there to be two, true flexibility at local level, free from central orders. According to the presiding officer, I'd like to reiterate my conviction that especially in times of financial difficulty, councils need to have the flexibility to deliver a more responsive and efficient local government, which is at best for both local communities and sustainability of their finances. Draw to close, please. Unfortunately, this government is intervening where it sees fit and not allowing this to happen. Thank you very Thank much. You. We now turn to the short open debate. I have two requests to speak. Speeches of four minutes or less would be better. Thank you. Kevin Stewart to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, in the forthcoming financial year, the Scottish Government will provide councils with a total funding package worth over £10.85 billion. This means local government's revenue funding and capital share will be maintained on a like-for-like -like basis with additional monies for new responsibilities, including childcare commitments. While I don't agree with what the COSLA President had to say about universalism this morning, I do agree with David O'Neill, Labour President of COSLA, when he made the stark contrast with local government in England clear. He said, since 2010, in real terms, English local government has experienced 14% cuts in its budget, whereas in Scotland we have experienced only 3%. Where we have maintained our share of total public sector spend or even increased it in England, this has gone down by 3%. Uh, Sir Merrick Cockrell, the chairman of the LGA in England, has said, every year I meet my opposite numbers in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, and they listen to us in wide-eyed disbelief at the budget cuts we are, we are enduring, and they are not. And in the recent Joseph Rintree Foundation report on local government funding, uh, they confirmed that Scotland has been protected from the drastic cuts that we've seen in England. And the report also found that the current constitutional setup limit the extent to which Scotland can follow a completely different path. Previously in the debates that we've heard on this issue, uh, we've heard the opposition parties call for more uh, money for local government, and they've done so today again in more measured tones, uh, I would have to say. Um, but 
they always fail to identify where those monies should come from. And I would ask the question, do they want to cut the health budget? Do they want to slash support to small businesses at a time when we're trying to grow the economy? Or, or do they actually want to hit hard-pressed families by raising the council tax, which this government has frozen? Uh, I will give way to Mr Rowley. Ali Rowley. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I've certainly not um, been in here today banging the drum for, for more money. Does he recognise that there is a serious issue with recruiting teachers in Scotland and that every local authorities right across Scotland are having to deal with that? Kevin Stewart. Uh, I, Mr Rowley is to be congratulated for his, his measured tones today, and I think there is some logic in terms of what he has had to say. Um, because I think there is uh, some recruitment problems in certain areas, and I think that councils need to take some measures to deal with that. That additional money will help them, I think, in terms of, of recruiting uh, more teachers. Uh, presiding officer, uh, in 2014-15, Aberdeen City Council received £327.969 million pounds in revenue funding. That will grow to 337.989 million in 2015-16. This increase of 10.02 million is very welcome. But, presiding officer, it will come as no surprise to folk in this chamber that I am about to make the same appeal that I have made whenever we discuss local government finance. I would urge COSLA to undertake a review of the local government funding formula, as I believe that Aberdeen fares badly from a system that was first designed over 40 years ago. If COSLA agrees to undertake this, they may be able to persuade Aberdeen City Council to return to the fold. Finally, presiding officer, I would like to put on record my gratitude to the government for agreeing to the recommendation made by the Local Government and Regeneration Committee to establish the Commission on Local Tax Reform. And I wish all of its members all the best in their endeavours. Many Thank thanks. You. I call Jackie Bailey. Presiding officer, I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak in the debate about the Local Government Finance Order. Um, there is no doubt that local councils are experiencing tough times. They are on the front line of local service delivery and have a huge role in delivering social justice and ensuring that preventative activity that we all value so much is taken forward at community level. But I'm afraid Kevin Stewart is wrong. This isn't a like-for-like -like budget. This budget represents a real terms cut to local government and that has been confirmed by SPICE today. I remember John Swinney talking about how much local government received from the Scottish Government and their ever-increasing share. It would be fair to say that he made a positive virtue of it. Indeed, in 2010-11, they received 38% of the Scottish Government. Today, it is 32%. That's 6% less and equates to a £1.8 billion mm. cut. He doesn't crow about it anymore. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation, in a recent report, tell us that local government spending in Scotland has fallen by 24% in real terms. Unison point to the significant reductions in the number of public sector employees, some 40,000 less, as evidence of the SNP's cuts. And contrary to what the Cabinet Secretary has claimed previously, SPICE do confirm that the local government's share of the budget is down as well. So everyone says there have been huge cuts. But the Cabinet Secretary remains in denial. He wrote to council leaders back in 2014, I think it was October or November, to tell them how challenging things were and how his budget had been cut by 10% by the UK Government and he had to pass that on. Never for a minute did they imagine that the SNP would take the Tory austerity cut from George Osborne and then double it before passing it on to councils. An austerity max is exactly what the SNP have delivered to local government. But it is the consequence of those cuts that I want to focus on now. Because just yesterday, another report was published by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. They were considering the cost of the cuts on council services and on deprived communities. They looked at four local authorities across the UK and Renfrewshire was the only Scottish authority. Aside from identifying that Renfrewshire had suffered the fourth highest reduction in spending from the SNP Edinburgh government between 2010 and 2014, they suggested that there was evidence of an east-west bias, with councils in the west suffering a 7.4% spending reduction compared to those in the east having a cut of 4.5%. And I do hope that concerns the Cabinet Secretary. Because deprived authorities and deprived communities have been demonstrated to be suffering disproportionately from the cuts and measures to tackle prevention 
have not come from the Scottish Government, but have rather occurred, where possible, at the Council's own initiative. Now, I think that is a damning indictment on the SNP. I think it exposes their empty rhetoric about tackling social justice, because what we see are all warm words, but no meaningful action, and they are being found out. It is little wonder, then, that Renfrewshire and others are crying out for resources that will help them address real need in their communities. And finally, presiding officer, let me come back to an issue I raised when we debated this in the draft order, and I heard the Cabinet Secretary today on the same subject, and that's the mitigation of the bedroom tax. I asked Mr Swinney then about the bedroom tax. I hear what he said about holding some of the money back to make sure that it goes to the right areas. Effectively, I think this is an underspend, but I would be grateful for his confirmation of that. But on top of that, discretionary housing payments are being reduced by the UK government. There will be less available for local authorities. He said he would fully mitigate the bedroom tax, but the budget line hasn't increased at all. So let me, presiding officer, in closing, ask him again. Will he help our most hard-pressed local authorities in some of our most disadvantaged communities to fully mitigate the bedroom tax and to make up the shortfall? Thank you very much. I now call on John Swinney to wind up the debate. Four minutes, please, Deputy First Minister. Mr. Officer, on the question of being found out, uh, Jackie Bailey has been found out on two counts. The first is that she's come here and she's bemoaned the funding settlement for local government. But she's gone through a budget process just a few weeks ago in which she asked me to spend all of the available consequentials that the government had available to it on the health service. And she was dissatisfied by the fact that I didn't do that, that I took certain decisions that invested in education, which the last time I looked was a local authority service, to support attainment in some of the most impoverished areas in our country. And what did Jackie Bailey do about that? Jackie Bailey voted against that. Yep. So that's the first count on which Jackie... Now Jackie Bailey shakes her head saying, no, she didn't. Jackie Bailey, I'm afraid to tell you, you voted against the budget. And, that was, and the budget included money to tackle attainment in some of the most deprived areas of the country. So that's the first basis upon which Jackie Bailey has been found out. Now, the second basis that she's been found out is on some of her supposed like-for-like -like comparisons. I think, I'll go away and look at Jackie Bailey's like-for-like -like comparisons, but I think Jackie Bailey's like-for-like -like comparisons include looking at the budget when the police and fire funding is in the budget and when the police and fire but is money is out of the budget. And that is not like for like. That is apples and pears. And that's the weakness of Jackie, one of the many weaknesses of Jackie Bailey's approach. Yeah, of course. Jackie Bailey. Well, you know, let those in glass houses be the first to throw stones, Cabinet Secretary. Can I suggest to you that actually these are the figures from Spice? They don't, they don't make the assumptions that you claim. Indeed, it is yourself that continues to count police and fire in the allocations when those allocations no longer exist. Cabinet Secretary. Let's, um, let's, we'll look at the SPICE analysis and we'll give a response about what's involved in the SPICE analysis. Now, um, Alec Rowley asked about teacher numbers and about uh, training of teacher numbers, uh, training of teachers. And the Education Secretary is heavily involved in discussions about workforce planning in a tripartite fashion involving the local authorities, um, the trade unions and the government. Whatever recommendations have come out of that tripartite discussion, the government has always followed. And I appreciate the issues that Mr Rowley fairly raises on behalf of local authorities. And uh, the Education Secretary will, of course, engage on all of those points. Mr Rowley also raised the issue about um, whether community planning partnerships were delivering within the themes of the Christie report. And I think he poses a fair question there. And that's where the government intensifies its work on uh, public service reform to ensure that at local authority level, um, at community planning partnership level, uh, the reconfiguration of services takes place to include a more preventative and a greater emphasis on preventative interventions. So the strategy, in my view, is absolutely correct. I'm pretty sure Mr Rowley agrees with the strategy and agrees with the Christie report. I think there is a fair question about whether it has been delivered with intensity. And to address Jackie Bailey's point, the government can't impose that. That has to be agreed and taken forward at local level within community planning partnership levels. Now, um, Cameron Buchanan uh, raised a, a number of points about the Accounts Commission report. I thought the Accounts Commission report was pretty complimentary to local authorities about the way they had managed the financial challenges that they face. Um, the Accounts Commission came to the conclusion 
that local authorities had managed the difficult financial situation effectively and encouraged them to continue to do so. And I, I, I echo those sentiments. And the Accounts Commission uh, report also talked about flexibility. And one of the greatest uh, elements of flexibility that we've given to local authorities is the removal of ring fencing from £2 billion of local authority expenditure, which was in place when we came to office and has been removed by this government, and it gives local authorities more flexibility to meet their priorities in local areas. And Apologies, on that basis, Deputy, I hope that addresses the issues close. that Mr Buchanan has raised in the debate, and I encourage Parliament to support the Local Government Finance Amendment Order. Many thanks, and that concludes the debate on the Local Government Finance Scotland Amendment Order 2015, and it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12624, in the name of Jamie Hepburn, on stage one of the Mental Health Scotland Bill. Could I invite those members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now? I'm afraid I have to advise the Chamber that we are incredibly short of time. We have no minutes in hand, and I therefore, as soon as possible, call on Jamie Hepburn to speak to and move the motion. Minister, maximum 13 minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding uh, Officer. I'm very delighted to open this Stage 1 debate on the Mental Health uh, Scotland and in doing so, uh, move the motion in my name that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Bill. I'm very pleased uh, to see that we're debating mental health for the fourth uh, time uh, this calendar year. This reflects the importance of mental health and the uh, interest this Parliament has taken. And I was very heartened President Officer, to hear you say we're short of time. I presume that indicates that there are a number of members wishing to speak today. Again, I think that emphasises uh, the great interest we have in uh, the subject matter. Uh, we have debated much of the uh, work we are doing to improve mental health and mental health services, both the progress we have made and the challenges uh, we face in improving uh, further, and doubtless we will debate that again. Uh, as part of that work, uh, President Officer, I am pleased to be able to uh, briefly update Parliament about the £15 million innovation funding that we announced in November. Demand for uh, mental health services has increased in recent years, and we must ensure that services continue to be effective and of high quality. This additional investment over the next three years will help drive further improvements to the quality and delivery of mental health services so that people get the help they need where and when they need it. The £5 million funding each of the next three years will comprise four key elements. Firstly, an allocation to NHS boards to be used in partnership with the wider public and third sector support improved access to child and adolescent mental health services and innovative approaches to delivering mental health services and identifying new ways of treating people. Secondly, an allocation to NHS Education for Scotland to further develop the quality of child and adolescent mental health services through training for staff and evidence-based psychological interventions. Thirdly, an invitation to NHS boards and their partners to work with the Scottish Government on developing innovative approaches to working with people in distress. And finally, an invitation to NHS boards and their partners uh, to submit proposals to develop novel approaches to meeting the needs of people with mental health problems in primary uh, care settings. And we will soon be writing in more detail to NHS uh, boards and their partners uh, around uh, this fund. And I'd be happy to uh, update members who are interested further on this if they would like me to do so. Uh, today, we are focusing on a key part of our uh, mental health strategy, one which looks to strengthen the rights and protections of service users through this legislation uh, that we debate uh, uh, this day. The chief aims of uh, parts one and two of the bill is to amend existing legislation so it works as effectively as possible for service users. The provisions uh, of the bill seek to uh, address issues raised in the McManus Review of 2009 and elsewhere. Part three introduces a victim notification scheme uh, for victims of mentally disordered offenders in a way that respects the rights of both victims and of vulnerable offenders. I was very pleased to note uh, from the report that the Health and Support Committee supports the general principles of the bill. I want to uh, thank them, the Finance Committee and Delegated Powers and Law Reform uh, Committee for their work in considering the bill uh, at stage one. I am very grateful uh, to the Health and Support Committee for the manner in which they took evidence at this stage uh, of the bill process. They invited a, a wide range of stakeholders to give evidence and did this in the spirit of drawing out uh, those changes that will, in line with the aims of the bill, best improve the system uh, for service users. The evidence in the committee's report have been uh, invaluable in helping the government to reflect on whether we have the provisions exactly right, uh, particularly where there is a range of opinions. And I uh, look forward to reflecting the comments of uh, members today before responding uh, to the committee's report in due course. Uh, I'd now uh, like to speak on some of the key individual provisions uh, contained within the bill. Uh, President Officer, Section 1 of the bill seeks to benefit 
uh, service users by giving them more time to prepare for their first tribunal hearing when a compulsory uh, treatment order is applied for. A particular aim is to cut down on repeat hearings, which can be distressing for service users. I have uh, noted the concerns expressed to the committee uh, that this change could see uh, service users detained for longer uh, before they automatically before appear before uh, a tribunal. Members uh, may have uh, noted the evidence given to the Health and Sport Committee by Dr Joe Morrow, President of the Mental Health Tribunal. Uh, Dr Morrow is very clear that these proposed changes are for the purpose of supporting service users by allowing more time to prepare for tribunal hearings and to cut down on repeat hearings. I, I only want to bring in change that will help uh, service users overall. We must balance uh, the benefits that we are confident will result against the concerns about extending the period of uh, detention uh, before the tribunal hearing. We are applying a uh, close thought as to how to best achieve that balance. I will be happy to hear uh, further views on that uh, matter. And one area uh, raised in the committee's report was the capacity of the mental health officer workforce. Uh, I recognise the incredibly uh, important work done by mental health officers, presiding officer, and their vital role in safeguarding the rights of service users. As I noted to the committee, the bill does not quite reflect uh, our intention around uh, me mental health officers' reports when certain orders are extended, which cause some under understandable uh, confusion and, uh, around potential costings, which was raised uh, by COSLA. We uh, will propose an amendment at stage two on that point to clear uh, matters uh, up. The bill uh, would introduce a very small number of duties for mental health officers, most of which are considered best practice already and relate to only a few cases uh, across Scotland. Although mental health officer numbers are ultimately a matter for local authorities, I am pleased to have seen an increase in the number of mental health officers receiving training. And in, in addition, uh, the government has recently undertaken a, a scoping exercise to gather evidence around the issue. And when the report is available, we will identify any appropriate actions uh, alongside stakeholders. Uh, the committee noted comments related to changes to suspension of detention. The government based these provisions closely on the recommendations in the McManus report and agrees with that report, aims that suspension of detention provisions should both be flexible to meet patient needs and contain uh, safeguards. Suspension of detention should not be used as an alternative to a less restrictive community-based order, which is why the safeguard of a tribunal hearing is included. Uh, the bill updates provisions in the 2003 Act around appeals against conditions of excessive security. As I noted before, uh, committee, the framing of the provisions in the 2003 Act no longer uh, reflect the nature of the estate, meaning we were unable to use the existing powers which talked of transfer from hospital uh, to hospital to bring in uh, an appeals process. We intend to introduce regulations setting out the levels at which appeals can be made at an early stage. Turning to the nurses' holding power, we feel it is useful to clarify that the power is to detain for a maximum of three hours and it can be uh, for the purpose of a medical examination uh, taking place. This is not uh, radically different from the current position of two hours, but extendable to three. I am very clear that, as now, we would expect the power to be used in line with the principle of least restriction and guidance, again, will reflect this. I have listened to the concerns about proposed changes to timescales for appeal on transfer to the State Hospital when unwell patients may need longer than four weeks to lodge an appeal. And I want to ensure that we strike the right balance with other concerns about the effect of the current timescales. We are carefully considering this matter ahead of stage two. On the issue of named persons, I have been reflecting whether we got the balance right between ensuring service users only have a named person if they want one and protecting the most vulnerable. The named person role is very important for many service users and important protection at a difficult time, and it is vital we get this right. I will be bringing amendments at stage two that seek to strike the uh, right uh, balance. One of the major changes in this bill is the victim notification scheme for certain mentally disordered offenders, which will sit uh, alongside uh, the existing scheme for uh, other offenders. This is in response to an EU directive on the rights of victims, which does not distinguish between the status of offenders. This government has also consistently shown its support uh, to victims of crime. We recognise that uh, these are offenders who are vulnerable themselves, and I will be seeking to ensure that we get the balance right uh, whilst ensuring that the rights of victims to information are fulfilled. I think that is fundamentally uh, important. Uh, the committee uh, acknowledges that this is intended as a limited bill designed to make the 2003 Act work as effectively as possible. I am aware 
that there are some uh, long-standing issues that some people would have liked to have seen included in this bill. This includes the issues raised by the Scottish Law Commission on incapacity and calls to bring incapacity and mental health uh, legislation uh, together. These are very complex issues, but I want to make clear uh, that I have heard what people uh, have been saying. There have also been uh, some uh, limited calls uh, about uh, persons with uh, learning disability or an autistic spectrum disorder and whether they should be included in the scope of the Mental Health Act. Uh, I'm clear that this bill might not be the best vehicle uh, for these matters. And I want to consider these issues further before coming back to Parliament separately from this bill process to update you, President Officer, and uh, other members on my uh, thinking. Uh, let me uh, conclude uh, somewhat ahead of time, I notice, uh, President Officer, uh, by reiterating the aim of this amending uh, bill, uh, which uh, is to improve existing legislation to ensure the system works as effectively as possible for service users, along with introducing a victim notification scheme for mentally disordered offenders. I look uh, forward to hearing uh, members' thoughts on the bill, which I hope, uh, I hope uh, the Parliament will support the general aims into working with members of all parties as we continue to take the bill through Parliament and ensure we have the most effective uh, system in place for treating uh, mental health disorders across the country. Thank you, President Officer. Many thanks, Minister. And concluding slightly early, might allow me to call all members in the open debate. I now call on Duncan McNeill to speak on behalf of the Health and Sport Committee. Maximum nine minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. One in four people have a mental health problem. But as Stephen Fry says, many more people have a problem with that. I would like to ask members here in this chamber this afternoon, and indeed everyone in the public gallery, to think of a person they know who has a mental health condition. Who is that person, that individual that's popped into your head? Is it a family member? a work colleague, a friend, or is it you? The reason I ask that question is that we must place at the heart of our consideration of the Mental Health, health Bill the person with the mental health condition. It is important that we look at the impact of the changes proposed by this bill would have on the individual requiring mental health care. During the Health and Sport Committee scrutiny of this bill, we have been mindful of the importance of the rights of the patient. This needs, of course, as the Minister says, to be balanced against the administrative processes in place to deliver mental health treatment. And as a committee, we broad, broadly, this bill has achieved the right balance. However, there are a number of areas, some of them outlined by the Minister, that we as a committee believe there is a need for, for some further clarification from the Scottish Government. Mr McNeill, could you turn your microphone slightly more towards you? Thank okay. you. I'm not usually encouraged to keep it quiet or hear it. We, while we welcome the Minister's um, uh, welcome of our report, and uh, he said, I think we, uh, it would be remiss not to express our disappointment that the Government's response to our Stage 1 report has not been received in time for today's debate. And that will mean that I will focus on some of the areas that are, have already been uh, mentioned by the Minister. Um, I hope that today the Minister will be able to offer some assurances and clarification on some of the following specific points. The first area within the Bill that I wish to highlight today is the automatic extension to the continuous period of detention alluded to by the Minister. And thinking again about this from the perspective of the patient, there were positive comments, as he said, from the Mental Health Tribunal. The Tribunal felt that the provision was about ensuring patients were ready, prepared to proceed at their first tribunal hearing, thereby, of course, reducing the need for people to attend multiple hearings with all the associated problems that that brings. 
We as a committee recognise that it is important that measures are taken to ensure tribunals do not exacerbate the circumstances of that stress for patients. However, concern was raised, serious concern was raised about the provision by the Scottish hum Human Rights Commission. The concern was discussed within the context of the European Convention on Human Rights, the issue being whether there was sufficient and proportionate justification for a blanket extension to apply to all patients. To ensure that this provision is compliant with the right to liberty and security, it's vitally, uh, vitally important that the government Assess, assesses the implementation of this provision closely. And I therefore ask the Minister if he could give us further clarification and respond to that recommendation later. Firstly, the government provides uh, uh, that firstly that the government would provide a detailed plan of the estimates in relation to the reduction in multiple hearings, which could be expected as a result of this provision. Secondly, that there is a clear monitoring regime which records the reasons for those delays and rearrange or repeat tribunals. And thirdly, that the government clarifies how deducting the proposed extension time from continuous period of detention will be calculated. To quote again from the president of the mental health charity Mind, one Mr Stephen Fry, if ignorance is bliss, we, why aren't there many more happy people in the world? Moving on quickly to another aspect of the bill, the provisions relating to placing new duties on mental health officers, again mentioned by the Minister. There is concern about the capacity of mental health officers to deliver these duties. They are already under pressure due to increased workload, an ageing workforce, and the difficulties, the clear difficulties that we heard in attracting new social workers into the role. In Glasgow City Council, for example, the number of mental health officers has fallen from 120 in 2011 to just 94 in 2013. So it is important that the provisions relating to the mental health officers can be delivered effectively. And I therefore seek from the Minister assurances that maybe some of that fun funding that is mentioned will find its way to support mental health officers and ensure that their, uh, uh, their provision is adequate to deliver what the bill propo uh, proposes. Another area of the bill relating to delivery of services by uh, specific professions uh, uh, is the proposed extension time for nurses to detain a person pending medical examination. Derek Barden uh, uh, of the Royal College of Nursing was you know, very frank in his assessment to the committee of this provision. He believed that there wasn't any evidence that these changes would have any impact whatsoever. Uh, again, the issue of patient rights and administrative efficiency raised its head with Derek Barron, telling the committee, our duty is to protect human rights, not to make things easier for our workload. As a committee, we believe that any provision that restricts a service user's liberty must be fully justified by robust evidence. I seek assurances from the Minister that this is the case. I also ask the Minister what steps can be taken to increase the accuracy and detail of the data recorded on nurse holding powers. There are other aspects of the Bill where we as a committee believe that there is a need for the Scottish Government to provide further information on the rationale and evidence which is, uh, has, its, uh, has informed its thinking. This includes the proposal to reduce the appeal period for people transferred from one hospital to another from 12 weeks to 28 days. Carolyn Roberts of Sam H told the committee, the argument is that the time for appeal delays treatment that might be required urgently. But we neither understand or nor think that it has any substance. 
Again, as a committee, we recognise the importance of protecting the patient's rights, and I therefore ask the, uh, the Minister to respond to the suggestion that should a transfer take place before the outcome of an appeal has been determined, the place that the patient has come from should be held until the appeal has been decided. It would be good if this could be offered as a guarantee to the patient. Begin with to the, close, please. With the, 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 well, I, I need to just jump to this stage and close on your, or in, your in instruction. And in conclusion, I would ask members not to forget the picture at the start of my speech when I asked you to think of that person with a mental health condition. I think by holding that, that individual in your sights during the Parliament's consideration of this bill, we can ensure that this is a robust bill and fit for purpose of mental health. Uh, fit for purposes for mental health legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm afraid even with the Minister's generous time back, we're still tight for time. I call on Dr Richard Simpson, maximum nine minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I refer members to my declaration as a Fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatry and Honorary Professor of Psychology? Presiding Officer, uh, the new funds uh, referred to by the Minister are, are, of course, welcome, though I would point out that proportionately Mental health funding is 75 million a year down on what it was in 2009. So I think we've got some way to make up. But I do welcome the new money, and I hope some of it will be applied to Tier 1 and Tier 2 of the CALM services uh, to support innovations like perinatal attachment work and uh, groups like Place to Be in primary schools where there's significant deprivation. I think this would help to reduce the growing demand on the CALM services at Tier 3, T4, and support also some of the 6,000 children whose referrals were rejected by the CAMS specialist services last year. This, I think we all agreed, is a fairly modest bill uh, from some of the McManus report recommendations, and it does seek to address some of the perceived weaknesses that have arisen in the 2003 Mental Health Act, the Criminal Procedures Act 1995, and the Criminal Justice Act 2003. Uh, given that it is modest, however, can I say from the outset Scottish Labour will certainly support the principles at stage one. However, we do believe, as Duncan McNeill indicated, uh, presiding officer, that there's a, a flaw in the proceedings of this parliament that makes this debate much less meaningful than it might have been. Had we had the response from the government to the committee's report, we could have then had a further debate in open parliament. I know that the rules don't require that at the present time, but I would urge the presiding officer and the SPCB to take a close look at this with the government to see if we can't make these debates more meaningful, because what we're doing today is often asking questions. Now, the minister has indicated today some movement on some of these issues, but we don't really have time to appreciate that and understand it, so I, my comments may not be totally pertinent, and for that, I apologise. However, uh, before considering uh, uh, the concerns of the committee and the evident people who gave us evidence, uh, I want to stress that the uh, committee, in taking oral and written evidence, uh, perceived that there was a probable need for a wider review of the Mental Health Act 2003 alongside the Adults with Incapacity Act 2000. Issues around human rights, the provisions covering those with learning disability and autism in particular should be examined, but also the complex interaction between the acts with regard to capacity needs to be revisited. Detention is a very serious business, and we have got to make sure that we've got it right and that we do apply the Milan principles of the least restrictive and allow our patients who are suffering from mental illness to go through this procedure as easily and support it, feeling supported as we can. I do have concerns also that some of the McManus report issues are not being addressed. Issues are either not included or not adequately covered. Concerns, for example, regarding the absence of independent advocacy in the bill. And if the Minister wants to take a look at this in respect to the Cabinet Secretary, he might look at the 2002 debates on the Mental Health Act, which I participated in, when Shona Robson said, advocacy should be everyone's right. This bill does not complete what Shona Robertson advocated herself for the Parliament at that time. I think there should be more focus, too, on the bit of the McManus report on groups subject to inequalities, such as asylum seekers, refugees and young people. And also the section 25 to 31, which McManus referred to, which deals with the obligations of local authorities to promote recovery and access to other services, including employability and educated 
he felt that these should be revisited. There's no indication of this bill of any intention of that sort. And finally, the expansion of mandated treatment uh, to include psychological care for families where appropriate. So those are some of the issues the bill doesn't cover. Let's take a quick look then at the issues that are covered and colleagues will deal with these some in these more detail. The extension of the number of days for a tribunal hearing. Now, the administrative situation is the number of repeat hearings has been reduced under the current chair uh, and that is extremely welcome. But we cannot have an ex a blanket extension which is purely for administrative purposes. The bill must, I believe, and I will move at stage two if the minister doesn't, that it, the extension should only be either with the, with the application of the individual to whom this uh, matter is concerned or with the consent of the individual or their named person in respect of not receiving an adequate report which the tribunal could consider and therefore avoid repeat hearings. So I would like two qualifications in the bill uh, in order to ensure that the rights of the individual are protected and we do not have a situation where there's simply a blanket extension and frankly there's a drift in the number of days in which people uh, uh, have, have a hearing. The new duties on MHOs, Duncan McNeil has already mentioned, uh, and that is some considerable concern uh, that the workforce planning on that is not really good. Now, we understand the, the government's response that COSLA got it wrong in terms of the number of additional reports. I remain to be completely convinced on this, and I would like to see further evidence from the government in, detail, in their detailed response. On nurse holding, yes. Jamie Hepburn. I, I mean, would Richard Simpson recognise what stage one evidence I was quite clear Cosler did get it wrong, but I did accept it was our fault. Richard Simpson. I did. In fact, I'm just exactly what I said, that I wasn't convinced that the, the, the figures Cosler had or the figures you've given us either are correct, and I'd like to see some more evidence on that, and we'll perhaps get into that at stage two. On the nurse holding powers extension to three years, no evidence on this. No evidence on this, on justifying this. And the human rights issue there is important. And when the nurses are telling us that they don't think it should occur, I think this should be deleted from the bill. The, on the appeal against transfer, I'm really concerned of a reduction from 12 weeks to 28 days for the right of appeal against transfer. Now, one of the justifications is to bring it into line with other appeals. I'm sorry, this is an area of such overwhelming importance that I would again would like to see some justification for this change other than an administrative nicety. Um, and have, will the government comment in their report on me, making sure that when there is an appeal or when there is a transfer proposed, that uh, till the time limit of the appeal is up, the bed should be kept open in the existing situation so that if the appeal is upheld, they can go back, because this is not happening. On the named person, my colleague uh, uh, Rhoda Grant will, will deal with this in some more detail, uh, but we certainly have some considerable concerns on this. On advanced statements, there are concerns from all of us on underuse of advanced statements. But what evidence from the government is of work from them to improve the uptake? These are proposed now to be held by the, Medical, by the Mental Welfare Commission, and I think that's reasonable, but they must be both secure on the one hand and readily accessible 24-7 on the other. There are concerns about advanced statements over their credibility with regard to the implementation. They do not have a general acceptance out there in the community that advanced statements are worth making, and I think we need more research to understand why that is, and then we need to drive those forward. We also need to look at the concerns about the currency in, in advanced statements. In other words, they need to be updated, so there should be not just the promotion of them, there should not there should be people who are re required in the boards or local authorities to to promote them, I, I think I don't have time and I've, I've got to, I may give way in summing up because I'm going to sum up at the end. Um, on the question of community leave and uh, our report, Para 78, the extension of 100 days, I think there are issues there uh, again. On the question of detention in the medium secure unit and transfer uh, uh, reduction, that is fine, but what about transfers within a hospital rather than to another hospital? I'm not sure that issue has been proper, properly addressed. And then there is the question of the low secure units, which don't feature at all here. Well, low secure is still secure. It's still a restriction of liberty, and there should be an appeal against that along with the medium secure. On, on the question of advocacy, uh, I, I've already mentioned uh, Shona Robson's speech in 2002, and I hope that in the second stage that the, that the government will consider uh, reintroducing this. Presiding officer, I will conclude early, but I will say this, that at the, in my summing up, I am also going to refer to the victim section, which I believe is excellent, but I believe it fails in one major regard, and that is the investigation and reporting on homicides and serious assaults 
perpetrated by a person suffering from mental illness. That is not included in this bill at all, and there is a considerable disparity between the, a dysfunctional, fragmented system in Scotland and the much better system that is occurring in England. I will return to that in my summing up speech. Many thanks. I now call on Annette Millen. Maximum six minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Let me say at the outset that we support the general principles of this bill, but like others, we have a number of concerns which we think need to be addressed by the Government during the next stages of the parliamentary process. The Health and Sport Committee's Stage 1 report indicates several issues raised by witnesses that either require clarification from the Minister or amendment to strengthen the legislation. And I must say that I have found it quite difficult to address these issues in a Stage 1 speech without knowing the Government's response to the Committee's report ahead of this debate. The 2003 Mental Health Care and Treatment Scotland Act, which this bill seeks to amend, was a very important piece of legislation aimed at minimising interference in people's liberty and maximising the involvement of service users in their treatment giving them the right to express their views about their care and treatment, the right to independent advocacy, the right to submit an advanced statement about how they wish to be treated when they become ill, and the right to choose a named person who can act on their behalf when necessary. This bill seeks to build on that by making some changes to current practice and procedures to ensure that people with a mental health problem can access effective treatment in good time. Presenting officer, in the limited time available to me, I'll focus on some issues within part one of the bill and on a few matters of concern not included within the proposed amending legislation. New duties placed on mental health officers raise the issue of workload for these specialist social workers in the face of an ageing workforce and difficulty in recruiting and retaining new MHOs. Whilst we accept the Minister's explanation of the discrepancy between the policy and financial memoranda and his assurance that the Bill's provision will not result in a large increase in the number and costs of reports required from MHOs, we do agree that there should be a strategic review of MHO provision with a view to improving recruitment, training and retention of this very important category of staff. I now want to deal with four key areas highlighted by Sam H and other witnesses which they consider require amendment. On the right of appeal against excessive security, we agree there is an urgent need to bring this into force and acknowledge the Government's proposed, although belated, action to bring regulations forward regarding this. But we do see the logic of extending this right of appeal to people in low secure settings, because within these settings there may well be differing levels of security, still within low secure accommodation, and I hope the Government will reconsider its stance on that matter. On the Bill's provision about named persons, I welcome the Minister's comments to Committee that the right balance might not have been struck, because the Bill, as at present drafted, allows a primary carer or nearest relative to be appointed by default if a named person hasn't been appointed, whereas the clear policy intention is that an individual should only have a named person if they choose to have one, and I hope this will be rectified at Stage 2. A lot of time was spent during scrutiny of the 2003 Bill on the provision of advanced statements to encourage the involvement of service users in their mental health treatment. So it's disturbing that 10 years on from enactment of that legislation, the right to produce such statements is underused and many service users are unaware that they actually have this right. At committee, the Government accepted the need to raise awareness of these statements and I, I very much support the Committee's recommendation that the Minister should consider placing a duty on health boards and local authorities to promote advanced statements. With regard to a register of these statements, clearly privacy and confidentiality are extremely important and I have some sympathy with Sam H's desire that the Mental Welfare Commission should merely hold information on the fact that a statement exists, when it was last updated and where it's kept. However, I also recognise the Government's position that a central depository would allow speedier access to them. However, we do need assurance from the Minister that the right balance can be achieved between availability and confidentiality. The right of access to advocacy was raised repeatedly with the Committee, with widespread concern that the Bill is silent on it. Whilst provided for in the 2003 Act, access to advocacy is still very patchy across the country. And when available, services are often explicitly targeted at supporting people who are subject to compulsory proceedings, whereas they could be of benefit throughout the system. There needs to be a proper assessment of these services to establish whether there is in fact a need to increase provision and access to independent advocacy and to ensure that local authorities are delivering their duty to provide appropriate services. And like other committee members, I welcome ongoing discussions with the local government that local authority advocacy provision could become part of the Care Inspectorate's review programme. Beyond that, I think we do need, also need information on how assessment of advocacy provision in secure settings and hospitals can be ensured. Finally, Presiding Officer, I want to deal with the concerns of people with learning disabilities and those on the autistic spectrum. 
who feel strongly that current mental health legislation is inappropriate for them. Steve Robertson of People First made a powerful plea for learning disability to be defined as an intellectual impairment rather than a mental disorder. And other witnesses asked for a wholesale review of mental health and incapacity legislation because of increasing knowledge of neurodevelopmental disorders. This clearly isn't the intention of the current bill, and it's important that an open dialogue is maintained between the government, the mental health sector, and people with learning disabilities and ASD with a view to future legislation to deal with these issues and meet the needs of the people concerned. There was also a strong case made for more clarity regarding the use of force, covered med medication and restraint in the interests of patients and staff, bearing in mind the 2003 Act's underlying principles uh, and human rights standards. So to conclude, presiding officer, whilst we will vote for the bill at stage one, we do share the significant concerns expressed by many witnesses and would like to see further consideration given by the Scottish Government to a more comprehensive review of mental health legislation to ensure compliance with human rights and to the development of specific legislation to meet the needs of people with learning difficulties and ASD. We hope for a positive response from the Government to these concerns as the Bill progresses. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. We are tight for time. Speeches of a maximum of six minutes. Bob Doris to be followed by Margaret McDougall. Um, thanks very much, President Officer. Um, can I start um, by thanking all the witnesses that, that gave evidence to my convener, Duncan McNeill and myself and the, the Health and Sport Committee, including the Scottish Government, and their, their open and ongoing engagement with us in relation to this, this mental health bill. Can I also... Um, we would make some open comments about how seriously I think the committee took, took proceedings when we are talking about you know, restricting people's liberty, uh, often against their will, in a very sensitive matter of, of, of mental health, and not just how that affects them, but also affects their families and wider society, and indeed when the section looking at uh, informing of uh, victims of crime, uh, where there has been a mental health disorder as part, part of the mix. We take that very seriously. But in a more... A uh, positive um, frame of mind, I have to say, uh, in relation to mental health more generally, um, I don't think it's a matter of whether someone uh, has mental health issues or not. We all have health that we have to nurture, and mental health is part of that. And we should all take cognizance of that, because there, by the grace of God, any one of us could go and have our liberty restricted because uh, of the need for society to be protected and for the rights of those with mental health disorders to be, to be treated, sometimes, unfortunately, against their will. I, I think both uh, the Minister and, and, and our committee convener outlined the main themes that, that, that have to be covered, and I'll just pick up on one or, or two of them, perhaps. I, I'd like maybe to comment in relation to the, 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 the named person, and I think that the, the real issue in relation to that is whether it becomes named person by default. So if there's not an obvious named person uh, that the person chooses, to become a next of kin, uh, a family member that does that. We have some powerful evidence that at committee about experiences of people who never chose to be a named person and found out things about their family members that, quite frankly, they never wanted to find out. So you have to actually protect um, the privacy of, of, of the person who is allocated the named person, but also the respect and dignity by which family members wish to, to know their loved ones that may be subject to a, a, a mental you know, health, health disorder. So I think a little bit more thought on that is needed as well. Uh, and where uh, a named person is not a family member, of course, we have to make sure there's still a, an appropriate communication conduit to the family to let them know uh, what is happening to, to their loved ones. There's a balance to be struck, and I'd ask the, the Minister to uh, reflect on that. Um, in terms of uh, appeal against excessive security, which, which we've heard, yes, I'd like some more information as to, to why the, the, the low secure setting uh, would not be part of that appeal and a bit more thought to be given whether there are different levels of security within a single institution and some more thought about whether that has to be fleshed out and we've heard some more information of course about whether or not uh, to go beyond a low secure setting could be a community disposal order of some description. Um, some of my concerns around that might go away in relation to what happens to you if you're put in a level of security by which you don't have the right of appeal You'd then have to wait two years, I think, until the next tribunal came forward. So perhaps there's something to be done in relation to how long you then have to wait for a for a tribunal in relation to have to have that to have that reviewed. That would be of interest to me as well. Um, a variety of things um, that I think uh, are important. In terms of advanced statements, um, 
I think one of the key things that, that we got was, yeah, yes, they are good things. How are we seeking to promote the use and the extension of advanced statements? And Sam H certainly raised concerns uh, with us in relation to the privacy arrangements around where those would be would be stored. I'm, I'm not sure I have any issues at all with a central register of them, but I'm minded they spoke about a central register merely signposting where those advanced statements are held. And, and whilst I'm not necessarily drawn towards that, I think we should take on board the, the concerns in relation to privacy that, that they uh, have, have drawn to our attention. Um, and another aspect that, that came up during our, our evidence sessions was uh, and what we heard from our, from our convener was about the, the application for a compulsory treatment order and the extension period from five days to ten working days in, in, in relation to that. I mean, uh, the fact that Dr Joe Morrow was, was content with that and he believed that it, it would reduce uh, further um, the need for multiple hearings, I, I, I'm, I'm fine with that. I suppose the caveats I would put in, of course, is we'd like to make sure that that doesn't mean the responsible professionals don't merely work to what they see as an extended deadline and still seek to, to uh, uh, move as expediently and as quickly as possible to, to, to having the, the tribunal uh, held in relation to whether there should be a compulsory treatment order. I think that that's important as well. In terms of whether that's a kind of blanket uh, additional 10 working days that come up during this debate. I think I'd be interested to, to know whether or not uh, currently uh, professionals work to the maximum deadlines because if there's an extension of five days currently and we're extending that to 10 days and it's not currently a blanket uniform operation, then it would be if we extend it to 10 days either. So I think a lot of caution in, in, in how we decide to proceed with this. I actually thought the, 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 the error in relation to uh, additional cases for mental health officers worked out to be quite, quite helpful uh, for the committee because we're now clear about what the additional pressures will be in mental health officers and for, for the sake of time we won't read out specifically what those are but it is much narrower than, than first thought but it did uh, give rise just to a, a, a positive uh, scoping exercise in relation to let's map out all the pressures and requirements on mental health officers currently to make sure that local authorities in partnership with the Scottish Government and the NHS get the work, work, workforce and workload planning right on that. I'm, I'm delighted the, the Minister appears to be responding to these concerns and I look forward to amending this uh, constructively at stage two. Thank you. I'm afraid members cannot go over their time. Margaret McDougall to be followed by George Adam. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Mental health problems are issues that can affect any one of us. They are not constrained by class, education or financial status, yet it is an issue that is often overlooked or misunderstood. Looking at the most recent Scottish Social Attitude Survey, we see that 26% of people said they had experienced a mental health problem at some point in their life. 47% said they wouldn't want others knowing if they ran into difficulties, while 17% said they wouldn't want to talk to anyone about it. From these statistics, it's clear that in Scotland there is still stigma attached to mental health issues. And if we are to overcome this, we need to make sure people feel comfortable talking about it and that they get the care and support they need. In North Ayrshire, the area I represent, in 2013, 13 males committed suicide, compared to three females. While sadly, these figures are lower than some areas, in my view, one death from suicide is one too many. These figures also highlight the need to tackle the stigma around the mental health and ensure that people are about able to talk about their mental health as they would about any other health issue and that they can get support. It's no surprise suicide is higher amongst men, given they are less likely to open up about their feelings, never mind admitting that they have a mental health issue. So it's vital that we, in this Parliament, get our legislation right by making sure it focuses on the individual and is strongly based on a human rights-centric approach, an approach which banishes the stigma and makes sure those experiencing issues feel comfortable coming forward. With that in mind, while I agree with the general principles of the Mental Health Care and Treatment Scotland Bill, I have a few reservations about it at this stage, some of which I will raise today. Firstly, the changes that are being proposed to timescales in relation to the right to appeal and detention could be seen as stripping away the rights of the individual. 
For example, the Scottish Mental Health Association states that the current plan to reduce the right to appeal against transfer to a state hospital from 12 weeks to 28 days is excessive. This sentiment is echoed by the Mental Welfare Commission. While I understand the reasoning is to ensure patients can access treatment quickly, a reduction from 12 weeks to 28 days is not acceptable for someone with a mental health condition. Also, increasing short-term detention certificates from five working days to 10 working days was, according to the Mental Welfare Commission, designed to tackle an issue that has since been resolved through administration improvements to the Mental Health Tribunal, and that, if this change was passed, it could mean that a person could be detained for six weeks before there is judicial scrutiny, which is completely unacceptable. The Act also has a range of privacy concerns, specifically the current legislation on named persons and advanced statements. On the issue of named person, if no named person has been appointed by the patient, then one is automatically appointed, such as a primary carer or nearest relative. This could prove problematic if the patient doesn't get on with that appointed named person. And as that named person would receive substantial information and have rights to participate in hearings. I welcome that the Minister has indicated that this issue will be revisited and I look forward to seeing the amendments at stage two. On advanced statements, I think they are a good idea and their use and availability should be promoted so more people are aware that this option exists. So I ask the Minister today what the Scottish Government is doing to ensure advanced statements are promoted. However, my concern, which is shared by Sam H, is that currently a full advanced statement would have to be shared with the Mental Welfare Commission. Given this includes highly personal information relating to the patient's mental health, there are serious privacy concerns about keeping copies of this document in full. Breaches in personal information can occur and mistakes happen, no matter how careful you are, and it would be devastating if advanced statements were released in full, given the stigma already attached to mental health issues. With that in mind, I would urge the Scottish Government to consider Sam H's suggestion that the Commission's register should simply note that a person has made an advanced statement, the date last updated, and where it is kept. To conclude, presiding officer, as we have heard today, there are numerous other issues with the Act in its current forum, and I sincerely hope they will be addressed as the Bill progresses through Parliament. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on George Adam to be followed by Jim Hume. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm no longer a member of the Health and Sport Committee, but I retain an interest in this as an ongoing issue because many of us, from a professional perspective and from a private perspective, as Duncan McNeill has already mentioned, will know these one in four people in Scotland who will experience a mental health problem this year. And that's one in four people. So it's mathematically impossible for us not to interact with some of these individuals as well. And that's why it's so important that when you look at the Mental Health Scotland Act, uh, we have to ensure that people with mental health disorders are able to access effective treatment quickly and easily. And as politicians, uh, we often talk about the stigma, and it's been mentioned a few times here today already, with regards to mental health. And we often talk about how we need to find a way to ensure that our communities uh, are aware that there's a stigma and we talk about it and we ensure that we have a situation where, as my colleague Bob Doris already said, where physical health and mental health are the same. We are either physically fit or mentally fit. You know, and uh, we have to ensure that we look at it that way because otherwise we have a situation where uh, we still continue with this stigma. And we have to wonder, what is it like dealing with uh, mental health issues here in Scotland in 2015? Because one of the most important things for, in my mind, is, would be the support mechanisms that's available to people with mental health issues. That's got to be very important. So today, I spoke to uh, Stephen McClellan, the CEO of Recovering Across Mental Health, Ramage. Uh, they're based in Paisley, and he said to me today that you know, many of his clients have difficulty with isolation and loneliness. 
They lose touch with their family and friends and their support mechanism there. And they, as an organisation, have to come in and try and make sure they replace that and give these people uh, that support. Stephen calls it uh, social poverty. Effectively, the, the socially, they end up at home, they're sitting in the house, and, and his exact words were quite brutal, but I think it probably explains it. He says, uh, presiding officer, that, you know, uh, how can you get someone better mentally, uh, to be mentally healthy if their only contact with the outside world is the Jeremy Kyle show in television? Because they've isolated themselves effectively from the world. And I think that's quite powerful. It's quite brutal what he's saying. But if we look at it from that point of view, we have to make sure that we do get out to these people to ensure that they have that interaction. Because it's a basic humanity, it's basic need that people need to make that difference in order for them to be able to get better. And Ramich and Paisley have offered this type of service for 25 years. You know, they, they, their, their guidelines is to make sure that people with mental uh, ill health are able to build independent, fulfilled lives. And uh, they say that the earlier they can get to the right uh, services to the people who need them, the more likely they are to recover quickly. And we need to be able to, they say they need to be able to respond to the demand and grow and develop their services. And much of this is reflected in the bill and, and in today's debate in particular. But Ramich have actually talked about six ways that they can do this and by providing immediate support in crisis situations, by supporting people in their homes and individualised care and providing drop-in centres uh, within their community and providing counselling to young people within their schools, effectively getting over the stigma idea as well, and by supporting carers, families and friends through education and raising awareness and misconceptions about mental health. And I think these are all uh, extremely important when we're dealing with this issue. Because, as I've said, the overarching aims of this bill is to ensure that people with mental health disorders are able to access effective treatment quickly and easily. And it's welcomed that the bill will provide an improved legislative system to help treat and care for people with mental health disorders. But this has to remove unnecessary procedures and make existing processes more effective and efficient for health professionals and, more importantly, for the patients themselves. Uh, I take on board what many of the committee members have already said with regard to the re central register, but I, I think the central register of, of advanced statements will improve the control that individuals have over how they wish to be treated or not treated should they become unwell and unable to make decisions for themselves. And I think that was an issue that was particularly brought up by my colleague uh, Bob Doris as well. But the advanced statements are documents where mentally ill patients record how they want to be treated in the event of them losing their capacity to make their own decisions. And I think that's something we have to ensure that we remember, because we're talking about the individual, we're talking about the person themselves, that what we can do to make them uh, effectively be able to be part of society again as well. And uh, one of the other things that I, the minister mentioned earlier on was the £15 million that will be invested in mental health services over the next three years. That's welcome. Uh, as has been mentioned by other members in the chamber, it has to be made, made sure it gets the right people in the right places at the right time in order to make uh, to ensure that we can uh, get to the individuals who really need it at that stage. Because uh, the public health minister Michael Matheson at the time, when he uh, announced the new funding, he said that this was to make sure that we could uh, get there quickly to offer the support when needing that. That's one of the things that I've probably gone on at length, presiding officer, but I'd just like to close with saying that health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. That's what the health, World Health Organisation says and I think we need to keep that in mind when we're discussing this issue and remember the individual who is the one that is dealing with it on a day-to-day -day basis. Thanks. Uh, now call on Jim Hume to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Lib Dems welcome the general principles of the bill, but believe it should adopt a patient-centred approach to keep with the Milan principles mentioned of uh, minimising interference in people's liberty and maximising the involvement of service users, users. Of course, there are some concerns. The Mental Welfare Commission and SAMH spoke in their evidence to committee about administrative efficiency being given more weight over the rights of patients. Uh, well, we of course agree that red tape should be reduced, but need to keep in mind that this bill must have its focus on patients' rights. There's concerns from professionals about the increasing role and duties that 
mental health officers have to undertake while running on overstretched uh, resources and reduced workforce numbers. So MHOs are vital for the patients and, of course, the NHS in, in, in general. I think this bill could uh, make the job even more difficult by... Uh, Yes, of course. Yeah. Jim yeah. I mean, obviously, I've heard what other members have said in terms of some of the provisions of this bill in respect of uh, additional burden on mental uh, health officers. Uh, the Mental Welfare Commission have confirmed that from November 2013 to November 2014, it would only been another 11 occasions that uh, reports have been required. It hardly seems an excessive burden. Jim Hume. Yes, but you must realise, that, according to Sam H, anyway, that two-thirds of local authorities report a shortfall of MHO resources. There's only uh, 57 MHO trainees, down from 108 in uh, 2008, and one in uh, three MHOs are aged 55 or older. So there are some concerns there. The government has, uh, of course, just got funding for the Mental Health Officer Annual Study Forum and the Mental Health Officer Newsletter. That forum was identified by the Scottish Association of Social Workers as providing crucial MHO training development and updates on tribunals. And the government said that this cut was to prioritise resources on implementing the Mental Health Bill over the next two years, but it's done so at the expense of some of the same people that are needed to implement the bill. A concern that was echoed across many expert views is the right of those kept in secure hospitals to appeal. Uh, the government has an obligation to introduce regulations for the purposes of these provisions, and we haven't received these regulations, and they're essential, I believe, in creating a fair system of appeals for patients. As, as a quote from the uh, memorandum, there is at present no provision for an appeal against levels of excessive security for patients other than patients detained within the state hospital. And that's a quote from uh, the government on its policy memorandum. Sam H supports the point that uh, appeals should include high, medium and low secure hospitals. And appeals against low secure accommodation aren't necessarily appeals against detention or a move into the community. We support the principle of applying the least restrictive alternative measures to the care of the users. I think the government should uh, also maybe perhaps consider its position on the reduced appeals time that we've heard about for hospital transfers to a, a third of the original time, the 12 weeks down to the 28 days, the extension period of nurse holding powers by a, an extra hour, and the impact uh, these two have on the overall safeguarding of patients' rights and treatment with respect and care for those patients. Royal College of Nurses, RCN, stated that such provision has no evidence and, and I quote, our duty is to protect their human rights, the patient's human rights, not make things easier for our workload, and quote. Sam H is also concerned regarding reduction in appeal time that, in their words, appears to be a substantial reduction in rights without proper justification. So there are some serious concerns out there, uh, not necessarily just from uh, members of the opposition parties, but from people who are involved in day to day. The Royal College of Psychiatrists and SAMH have concerns about the broad scope of access to patient info. Advanced statements are critical in engaging the rights and wishes of the patients and truly have to reflect the patient's uh, rights. I believe it's crucial that the use of advanced statements is, of course, increased. But as the experts have pointed out, uh, experts such as SAMH and uh, for example, uh, as, as they've said, that is absolutely crucial. The Royal College of Psychiatrists, as I said, Sam H have concerns about that broad scope of access to patient info. Advanced statements are critical in engaging the rights and wishes of the patients and truly must reflect uh, those patients' rights. It's crucial that the use of advanced statements is, is increased and that must tighten the scope of people who have access to such personal information. Presiding uh, officer, in closing, Lib Dems support the direction of this bill, at least at stage one. Uh, it's a step towards better treatment in the new mental health strategy, but I believe we must also keep in mind the wider reasons that progress has to be made in the protection of patients' rights. As the bill progresses, I look to the minister and ministers for assurances uh, regarding the concerns I've, I've raised, as well as provisions for wider education, training of awareness of the patients' rights, independent advocacy and building structures for monitoring uh, compliance. As said, Lib Dems shall support uh, the, the bill at this stage, but would look for assurances as, uh, as the bill goes through stage two and stage three. Thank you. Hey, thanks.
Now call on Roderick Campbell to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to pass, participate in this debate at stage one on the bill, though obviously I'm not a member of the committee itself. But as the Minister has indicated, the aim of the bill is to ensure that people with a mental health disorder are able to access effective treatment quickly and easily. But as is also stated in his opening remarks, uh, this is uh, not a bill that deals with all aspects of mental health. As Duncan McNeill indicated in his opening remarks, however, one in four people experience a mental health problem in any given year, which gives us an indication of the importance of effective treatment. The bill, of course, follows on from the 2003 Act and also from the McManus Review. The very nature of mental health problems and their complexity create extremely difficult circumstances for patients and families, especially when it is someone who is detained due to a compulsory treatment order. So in my view, it's right and proper that before such orders are made or extended, that adequate time is made available for representations and advice to be obtained. Accordingly, in my view, the provision to increase the time that a period of detention is automatically extended beyond the date at which short-term detention certificates would otherwise expire from five to ten working days seems a sensible proposal. The risk of a longer period of pre-detention, I hope, is more of a theoretical than practical issue, and I hope that Joe Morrow's comments can be accepted. And as a member of the Faculty of Advocates, I'm happy to endorse the views of my namesake, no relation, Kenneth Campbell QC, not only on the question of a blanket extension, but his comments on the uh, whole aim of involving the tribunal in procedure to ensure as far as possible that patients' convention rights are properly addressed. And indeed, I note the Law Society, whilst they were not in favour of a blanket ban, did so largely on the basis of arguing that they didn't see any particular benefit to it. I understand and agree with the committee's view, however, on the need for clarity on the issue of how deducting the proposed extension of time impacts on the continuous period of detention. In relation to orders regarding levels of security, the fundamental Milan principle of least restriction ought to be a key feature of any mental health strategy, and there clearly need to be appropriate opportunities to appeal against orders detaining people in conditions of excessive security. Nevertheless, I share the Minister's comments on the, uh, the question of low security settings, whilst noting the committee's comments on that aspect. As for time for appeal in relation to transfers from one hospital to another or to the state hospital, the reduction in the appeal period from 12 weeks to 28 days is clearly very substantial. I understand the difficulties that such a long period causes at the present time, as indicated in the policy memorandum, and I clearly believe that getting an appropriate timescale for an appeal is not an easy task. I know that many stakeholders think that this change is too radical, and I think it probably does merit some further consideration, or certainly justification as to the extent of, of uh, that reduction. Certainly, I, I share the view, however, of others that any transfer that does take place should not impact or prejudice a right to remain in the original hospital. With regard to named per persons, the importance of named persons must not be underestimated. The right of people in such vulnerable circumstances to have the right to choose someone to fulfil this role is fundamental, but as the Scottish Government already recognised, this should be subject to an opt-out provision. The question is how to make those opt-out provisions effective, and accordingly I welcome the commitment to look further at those proposals. I agree with the committee, however, that the right to nominate a named person should be restricted to those over 16. Those under 16 remain a particularly vulnerable section of the population and certainly require protection, even though I accept there may be well be many under 16 with the maturity to make that choice. And I also accept that uh, there are other areas of Scots law where uh, people under 16 can enter into certain arrangements uh, on the basis of uh, an acceptance of their maturity and understanding of the situation. So uh, it's obviously that there are arguments about that. As to advanced statements in the words of Dr. Jill Stavert of Edinburgh's Napier University, advanced statements are an important form of supported decision making. It does appear that these are currently not used to quite the level originally anticipated and that there is a requirement for further increased awareness and training on their use. The committee seeks to promote them by considering placing a statutory duty on health boards and local authorities to promote them. There is, of course, a difference between encouragement and requirement, and I would certainly favour a lighter touch. As for care for children under the age of one, the right of a mother who is a patient to care for her child, provided she not, does not endanger it, allows us an essential level of normality for her and the child at a very important stage of development. 
To remove the, the maternal right would create an intolerable level of stress for a mother who is already suffering from a mental health problem. So I therefore welcome the proposal to extend this right from the current provision whereby it only applies to mothers suffering from postnatal depression to, to other conditions. Cross-border transfers and absconding patients. I must admit I looked uh, briefly at this in the legislation, draft legislation. Uh, I think it's quite complex. All I would say is that I think patients' rights should be a priority in that setting. As far as victim notification provisions are concerned, we've obviously recently extended those provisions in relation to offenders leaving prison. It certainly seems to me that a victim notification scheme in relation to victims of mentally disordered offenders seems appropriate. It's right the victims be fully recognised, but as with other offenders, it ought surely to apply to the more serious situations. And uh, I'm also slightly concerned as to how exceptional circumstances could be defined that would justify it applying to compulsion and restriction orders. And certainly clarification on that would be helpful. As to independent advocacy, there is, I know, concern in many parts of Scotland about the operation of the existing provisions. I certainly believe requiring the care inspector to assess the existing, to assess the existing provision by local authorities would be a sensible first step. Finally, presiding officer, close, please. any strategy must be rights-based, and as the Mental Welfare Commission suggests, have a strong focus on prevention. Like physical health, prevention is certainly better than cure. Thank many you. thanks. I now call on Rhoda Grant to be followed by Linda Fabiani. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, as Richard Simpson said, I want to concentrate on the named person, and I welcome the minister's um, statement that he is keen to strike the right balance of that. However, we don't have a de any detail of what he's looking for, so I want to make some comments around this area, and hopefully they'll be taken into account while he reassesses the, the, the bill. Um, currently, as many other speakers have said, a patient can appoint a named person to act on their behalf. If they haven't the capacity do, to do so and haven't done it previously, their next of kin takes on that role. Um, that person becomes the patient's advocate, representing them at hearings, having a duty of care for that patient, taking decisions indeed about their treatment. And they have full access to a patient's records to allow them to carry out that role on behalf of the patient. We hear in committee of huge swathes of paperwork dropping on people's doormats, which they're supposed to read, understand and act upon in the best interests of the patients. It's an extremely difficult job and sometimes with that paperwork arriving is the first knowledge that they have been given this role. Some patients would prefer not to have a named person because there's no one they would trust with this extremely personal information. And the bill allows them to notify that they do not wish to have a named person and that is a step in the right direction. However, if they've not nominated a named person and have not indicated that they don't wish a named person, the position reverts to that that was previously in place, that their next of kin automatically takes on that role um, in, in future. And we've heard evidence from both patients' uh, organisations and indeed carers' organisations that this should not be the case. When a person has not been nominated a named, as a named person, one should not be appointed on their behalf. And this is because it's reasonably common that the trigger for somebody's mental health problems is that something could have happened due to close family circumstances or problems. For example, if someone was abused by a parent, then that same parent would have access to all discussions surrounding that abuse in their case notes. If they were abused by another family member, for instance, then their next of kin would learn of this, sometimes for the very first time when being appointed as a named person by the state. And this can't be right. It destroys family relationships. It breaches a patient's confidentiality. It also means that a patient might not disclose information to professionals in fear that this might then be divulged in future to their family members. Carers also stated that they should be allowed to say whether or not they were willing to be a named person. Next of kin has that role foisted on them by the state, but are not able and maybe not be able or prepared to take it on. They can live long distances away or indeed have fallen totally out of contact with the patient. It simply may be that they're not fit themselves or have the ability to carry out such a complex role. They're keen that they are not the default named person and they also wish to be able to decline the appointment if they were appointed as an in-person by the patient themselves. They need to be able to say whether or not they are willing to take on that role. And I therefore believe there should be no default situation and that the in-person should have the ability to decline this role. 
That does, of course, then bring us to the question of who can speak for the patient if they cannot speak themselves. And they need access to advocacy and an advocate appointed to look after their interests. But carers also have a role to be heard at a tribunal and have their input heard and listened to by medical staff. They can also give an insight into the patient's health, wishes and the like. However, it shouldn't be, they should not have any access um, to the patient's records because that's an abuse of privacy. Carers have told me previously that they receive very little information and support from clinicians. Their loved one often comes home with no information about how they should be at best be supported. Suicide risk is at its highest when someone is discharged from hospital. Carers need to know what they should be doing to support their loved ones and to ensure their well-being. It's normal if you're discharged with a physical illness to come home with a sheaf of leaflets that tell you what to do or not do. And indeed, that same information is available to carers. We surely should have the same standard for people suffering from mental health issues. There are a number of other things that I wanted to touch on very briefly. Advanced statements, for example, a good thing but too complex. And also should maybe, maybe have some more information about the patient when they're well, their tastes, their likes to help with their recovery. Presiding officer, in conclusion, I believe we should um, support the bill at stage one and improve it at stage two. We need to ensure that care and treatment is patient-centred and we do all we can to promote autonomy at a difficult time in patients' lives. If we do this, we promote recovery. Many thanks. I now call on Linda Fabiana to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, thank you very much, presiding officer. Um, can, I, can I state first and foremost that I'm not in the health committee. Um, I, I have a particular interest in mental health issues, but even though this is a fairly small bill and it's an amending bill going on from the 2003 Act, I have to say there's a lot in there. And, you know, different speakers this afternoon with far more knowledge than I have um, have spoken of many of the different aspects of this bill. But I did um, take time to read the Health Committee's report, which I found extremely useful. Um, and a, a lot of food for thought in there. I mean, I understand now that the Health and Sport Committee found um, the response, the public response they had to the proposals generally positive, and uh, that whilst the committee overall is supporting the general principles of the bill and recommending it to Parliament, um, they did note that the bill could, in fact, be strengthened and or amended in terms of protecting the rights of patients whilst ensuring that they are able to access effective treatment quickly and easily. Uh, it was really interesting to hear everything said. I can't remember who made this point, to be honest, um, was the fact that some of the emphasis in the bill was about being, uh, having more effective treatment more quickly and more easily, but that the emphasis of it might, in fact, be towards the service provider rather than to the patient themselves. And, and I think if there is any even perception of that, that perhaps these particular clauses should be looked at again, because central to anything we're doing here should be the patient themselves and how we can make things better. I, I did uh, yesterday, along with John Pentland, a Labour colleague, attend uh, the spring members' meeting of Lanarkshire Links in Strathclyde Park. And Lanarkshire Links are a very active um, service user and carer organisation with an involvement in mental health. Um, we had representatives from the health board and from both Lanarkshire councils, as well as the Mental Welfare Commission for Scotland. It was primarily to talk about health and social care integration um, that's obviously starting as the shadow exercise very soon and then uh, moving further next year. And one of the things that came forward very, very strongly at that meeting was that people felt there was a, a great deal of difference between consultation and actual participation. And that while... Um, it could be said that people were consulted very often. They felt as if they hadn't been able to participate. And I would say that one of the things that's very particular to mental health issues 
is the right and indeed the need um, for people who are affected and who are using services um, to be able to participate in the formation of these services. And I would like some level of assurance from the Minister that uh, whilst we say that there were a great many consultees, that there was a real level of part participation in how we made move forward. Because one thing that's coming through very, very strongly to me, both from the committee report, from speaking to different people, and from what colleagues here with more knowledge than I have of this bill today have been saying, is that the right of access to advocacy does not seem to be as strong as it could be. It certainly hasn't been in terms of what the intention was from the 2003 Act. And I think this is an opportunity where we can make that much more effective. And I would like to think that we really are taking that opportunity. Advocacy is an issue generally, of course, covering issues way beyond the, the scope of this bill. Um, but in terms of someone's treatment, in terms of the uh, issues that we're talking about, about named persons, etc., in relation to this bill, I think independent and trustworthy advocacy is extremely important. So again, I think some uh, assurances on that would be very, very useful. Another thing I, I would like to mention, although there's, there's not much time to go into this, but I was very struck by um, the section in the Health and Sport Committee's report on page 31, sex starting with clause 213, about review of legislation for those with learning disabilities, autistic spectrum disorders. And I think that is an issue that it is now time to look at much more closely and in much more depth. Um, I certainly uh, don't have the background knowledge, nor indeed have I been able to do enough learning of late to have definitive opinions on this myself. But I think the concerns that have been expressed through committee and indeed the acknowledgement that the minister gave to the committee about the need for ongoing dialogue uh, would suggest that we have to take this very, very seriously indeed. And my final point, um, presiding officer, would be uh, I note that the committee noted that there was no quality impact assessment made or produced to accompany this bill. And like the committee, I would appreciate some clarification from the government as to why this wasn't produced. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I now call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Sandra White. Officer, I'm very pleased to be speaking on this bill today, which is for the most part a series of amendments to the Mental Health Care and Treatment Act, which was passed, of course, uh, exactly 12 years ago uh, to the month at the very end of the first uh, four-year session of the Scottish Parliament. It was uh, certainly the longest bill of that session, and I think it's generally recognised to have been uh, one of the most significant and uh, ground-making. It set up a new mental health tribunal, strengthened the Mental Welfare Commission, created a new community treatment order, established a right to independent advocacy, as well as named persons, advance statements, and a great deal more. Crucially, it had novel provisions to ensure the protection of mentally ill people, and everything was governed by a set of principles uh, including the principle of the least restrictive manner and environment um, compatible with the delivery of safe and effective care. And that leads me uh, to the first point I want to make uh, about section 11 and 12 of the bill, which is to do with appeals against the level of security. And of course, uh, I don't know if there's a second example, but it's the only one I can think of where an act of this parliament actually ended up in the Supreme Court. And if there's one person that we have to... Um, I was going to say blame. I don't think it's blame. We need to blame the two governments who didn't implement the regulations that Mary Scanlon demanded in an amendment uh, in March 2003 when she said regulations had to be laid by 2006 and they never were laid by my government or the government which uh, took over in 2007. Now, the Supreme Court judgment... I give way to Jim Hepburn. Hepburn. I thank Malcolm Chisholm for um, his point. Would he recognise, though, that the bill as was original, or the Act as it is framed, doesn't reflect the reality now, so it would, wouldn't have been possible to bring forward those regulations. That's why we need to make this change to the, the bill now. 
the acting. Well, they could certainly have been brought forward. Well, I, I don't actually uh, agree with that. The fact of the matter is uh, that the court judgment is interesting, and I'm moving on to the other interesting thing about the court judgment, of course, which is that um, um, the person bringing the judgment was in, this, in low security, and yet the bill is saying we can only appeal if you're in mid medium security, and the Law Society says that's restrictive and discriminatory, and Sam H. and many other organisations uh, agree with that. It was clear in the 19, 2003 Act that uh, it was a right for patients detained in hospitals, other than the state hospital, there was also, of course, a right for those at the state hospital. There was no mention of medium secure, and intention is important. I also note that the Mental Welfare Committee consultation on the bill uh, had as one of its conclusion that the, those in low secure uh, settings should also have the right to appeal. So I hope that the government will change that at stage two or three and also crucially tell us when the regulations will be introduced because we don't have to want to wait 10 years uh, uh, as we have to wait for the uh, regulations from the previous Act. Now um, the concerns about changes to timescale have been referred to by many speakers so I won't spend much time on those except to say that all four of them are very well described in the Mental Welfare Commission uh, briefing for us in this debate. And the Mental Welfare Commission is an organisation that ministers and MSPs should always pay very close attention to. So they are concerned about all uh, the ones that have been mentioned, the, the appeal against in order to transfer to the state hospital, which is being reduced from 12 weeks to 28 days, an extension of short-term detention, pending determination of a CTO application, which is going up from five to 10 days, um, the current power of nurses to detain, which is going up from two to three hours against the wishes of the RCN and other nurses. And also perhaps, which hasn't been mentioned, the 28 days in hospital for a mental health assessment in, in criminal cases and a 14 day extension to that. So the Mental Welfare Commission are concerned about all of those and I think the government should pay heed. They should also always pay heed uh, to the Scottish Association of Mental Health, who have not just late raised concerns about the time scales and the level of security issue, but have also late raised concerns about the named person. The McManus Review recommended that the default named person uh, be abolished, so let's abolish it. The Sam H are also concerned about the Mental Welfare Commission uh, holding uh, uh, advanced statements with great details about individual uh, um, uh, circumstances. They feel that's a breach of privacy, <coughs> and I think we should follow their advice on that. And everyone, of course, is saying that we should be doing far more to promote advanced statements, so I would support a duty on the NHS and local authorities to do that. We haven't heard too much about the victim notification scheme. I think it's better now than it was in the consultation uh, document, but I think it would be helpful to have a clear statement regarding minor offences committed by individuals with... Um, <coughs> um, excuse me, um, with, 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 with um, um, a mental disorder not being including in the victim notification scheme. In other words, uh, levels of uh, offence that would not be in the notification scheme if you didn't have a mental disorder. There needs to be an equality here between the level of offence that we're talking about. And people are concerned about Section 48, where the government could introduce regulations to include those who are only on a compulsion order. So I think that is a concern for some people, still many people, I think. So, uh, one minute left. What's omitted? We need more on the local authority obligation in sections 25 27 of the bill. But most of all, uh, the McManus report rep highlighted a number of issues regarding the access to independent advocacy, including the appropriate level of position, uh, provision, sorry, adherence to the Scottish Independent uh, Advocacy Alliance Good Practice Guidance, collective advocacy and advocacy for carers. But there is nothing in the bill whatsoever. Section 259 of the uh, 2003 Act uh, gave a right to every person with a mental um, uh, disability uh, to have access to uh, uh, independent advocacy. M many areas are uh, only applying that right to those subject to compulsory measures, which is a misreading of the 2003 Act. So we must have a strengthened duty on the NHS and local authorities to ensure the availability of independent advocacy. Many thanks. Many, many thanks. And now call on Sandra White to be followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you very much, President Officer. Like others here, I'm not a member of the Health Committee, but I have been following uh, this piece of legislation very closely. As other members have mentioned, uh, you just have to look at constituent family 
whatever, uh, someone knows someone who suffers from a mental health illness. And if there's anything we can do to improve not just their lives, but their carers and others' lives, I think it's incumbent on us as a parliament to absolutely do that. And that's why I say that I think this is a very important piece of legislation which has already been mentioned, it seeks to improve the Mental Health Act Scotland 2003 and carry out the recommendations of the McManus Review, uh, which was set up in 2008 uh, of the Mental Health Care and Treatment Act 2003. And I'll come back to that. And I note that Malcolm Chisholm had picked up on, on that particular part uh, as well. And I want to come back to that particular issue uh, later on. Uh, I do believe that uh, improvements and in, in this will improve the operation and efficiency of the legislation for both users and practitioners also. Uh, presiding officer, mental health illness is one of the greatest challenges we face in Scotland. In de indeed, depression is a leading chronic uh, condition in Europe, with 400 million people suffering globally, and with women more likely to be affected by this than men. And uh, I do want to thank the Scottish Government, both present and past, for recognising the very real challenges this illness presents to both sufferers and the relevant agencies working with them. And uh, I hope that many members, I'm sure, will share these uh, sentiments also. Uh, many members have mentioned not just issues within their constituency, but the fact that uh, suicide, etc., uh, and the mental health is suffering from that also. So I think it is a very, very important piece of legislation. Now, I wanted to mention the fact and pick up on Duncan McNeil had mentioned mental health officers uh, and I would like to raise this particular issue. Uh, it has been mentioned before, as I've said, uh, about the number and retention of officers in Glasgow and it does raise concerns. Uh, I do understand there may be some crossover with adults with incapacity legislation and they may cause difficulties. Also some crossover with Mental Health Care and Treatment Act, which uh, Malcolm Chisholm had mentioned. And I know that the Minister will be aware that under the Adults with Incapacity Act and the Mental Health Care and Treatment Act 2003, there is provision for appointment of mental health officers in cases of guardianship. Now, under this provision, an application may be made by mental health and adult protection to a local authority's social work department uh, for the appointment of a mental health officer. Uh, recently, I have had concerns uh, for constituents that has actually been raised by, by them that this process is leading to delay in the appointment of these officers. And given that the overarching aim of the mental health bill is to ensure that people with a mental health disorder are able to access effective treatment quickly and easily, I would wonder if the Minister, in his summing up, can say whether this will be addressed, this issue will be addressed in the proposed legislation, or whether it does actually fall out with the remit of this particular legislation. And that's where I come to what Malcolm Chisholm had mentioned about you know, the Care and, Care and Treatment Scotland Act. Is this actually being delivered appropriately? So I think it's perhaps something uh, we maybe want to look at, not just as individual MSPs, but obviously uh, on the health committee also. So I would be grateful if we could look at that. Is there a crossover between the, you know, this particular act and the Adults with Incapacity Act also? I would be grateful if I could get some clarification on that particular uh, issue. I do welcome the Minister's recognition of the difficulties local authorities have in the area of mental health officers and his assurances uh, that are given that the bill will not result in an increase in the number of reports required to be produced. Uh, I do look forward to look, looking through this bill through its progress through Parliament and I do look forward to taking further part in the aspects of this bill. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you. And I now call on Alison Johnston, after which we will move to the closing speeches. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by applauding the work of our frontline medical services, who do a fantastic job with patients who present with some of the most complex needs across the NHS. And equally important are community organisations who improve people's mental health with support services, social inclusion projects and other preventative actions, often under testing circumstances with limited resources. And thanks to the hard work of campaigners, more people today feel able to talk about mental health. But as colleagues have covered, there's still a long way to go to bring mental ill health in line with physical ill health. A staggering one in four adults, as we know, will be affected by some form of mental ill health in their lifetime, similar to the numbers affected by cardiovascular complaints. Now, the majority of people suffering from mental ill health 
do not require hospital treatment. GPs and other mental health professionals are often people's main contact with formal help and sometimes the only place where people feel they can open up for fear of letting down family members or not wanting to, to worry loved ones or perhaps just feeling afraid or ashamed. So I think it's really important that we ensure that GPs have the support they need. And there's also a need to adopt and find more creative and innovative approaches to mental health care. Engagement in the arts, for example, is extremely beneficial to service users. It reduces medication consumption and hospital visits. And arts engagement not only helps patients, it's been found to increase staff wellbeing and increase staff retention too. And GPs are now issuing exercise as an alternative or a complementary prescription to medicine. A high quality built environment, access to quality green space are well known to increase people's well-being and mental health. And education about mental health, happiness and how this contributes to general well-being is also important, especially for young people. People in poverty and individuals and communities who may feel marginalised, for example, refugees and asylum seekers, have disproportionately higher levels of mental health illness here in Scotland. And this health inequality needs to be acknowledged and confronted. Hospital treatment is still needed for those most vulnerable patients. We know the target waiting time for those with mental health issues is 18 weeks, with 4% waiting over 35 weeks for treatment. Now, differences in targets, targets for different illnesses and different conditions should be based on sound medical reasons, and they should treat mental ill health on a par with physical ill health. And the Minister has pointed out that this is what the legislation requires. I broadly welcome the new Mental Health Bill and the improvements it will make to the treatment of those suffering from mental ill health. The Mental Health Act Scotland 2003 was considered to be comprehensive and to provide better safeguards for patients compared with other parts of the UK. And Sam H indicate in their briefing that appointing a patient's nearest relative as a named person may in some cases be inappropriate. And I'm pleased that the Minister has promised to revisit this area. The briefing provided by the Royal College of Psychiatrists highlights the lack of secure facilities for both women and young people in Scotland. The problem is so severe that it results in young people being admitted to Carstairs State Hospital. A solution to this, as suggested by the Royal College of Psychiatrists, would be to designate part of one of the secure schools, this is for young people of course, so that it has inpatient status, preventing those young people being admitted to Carstairs. And currently, female patients who require high security treatment are being transferred to Rampton Hospital in the East Midlands. Now, this could greatly hamper the patient's recovery as they're far removed from friends and family and from an environment and community that they know. And they're also treated out with the jurisdiction of the Mental Health Act, Scotland 2003. Concern has also been raised regarding the length of time it may take to transfer potentially acutely unwell prisoners to a psychiatric hospital for treatment. Finally, presiding officer, Inclusion Scotland have highlighted that concern that both people with learning disabilities and or autistic spectrum disorders could be subject to a compulsory treatment order, whether they're suffering from mental ill health or not. And it's vitally important we get the balance right here. And Inclusion Scotland suggests an alternative system is needed. So again, I broadly welcome this bill, but I do encourage the minister to listen to concerns and constructive suggestions from those with great experience because we know that mental illness and physical illness are interlinked. People with depression suffer from tiredness and lethargy, an unwillingness to eat. Their immune systems can be more susceptible to other conditions. Mental health issues complicate health issues associated with old age, such as cardiovascular disease. And many eating disorders, which are certainly physically debilitating in many cases, have mental ill health roots. And this is why mental health needs to be treated with the same care as physical health. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we now move to the closing speeches, and I call on Mary Scanlon. Uh, seven minutes, please, Mary Scanlon. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I would also like to uh, commend the Health and Sport Committee for their scrutiny of this bill under the very able leadership of uh, Duncan McNeill. Uh, having listened to all the speeches today, I, I think I have to say... We may have leading mental health legislation in Scotland, but I'm not actually convinced that we have leading mental health implementation. And I think that's the issue that we're looking at today. 
Uh, unfortunately, I can't commend the Scottish Government for listening, taking on board the recommendations of the Health Committee, given that we're still waiting for the response. Uh, and after six weeks and no response, today's stage one debate can only look at one side of the coin, unfortunately. And I also seek your guidance, Deputy Presiding Officer, because normally at the end of the stage one debate, we go off and uh, go through our speeches and hand in our amendments. I don't know when we hand in our amendments because this is really quite unusual. I would like to start by looking at advocacy. In 2003, uh, we spent quite a bit of time on advocacy and uh, you know, the right of access to ag uh, advocacy, right to independent ag uh, advocacy. But it, again, we've got a right to something, but if it doesn't happen, who do you go to? Nobody knows. And so that's my point about implementation. There's no point in having a right unless there's something you can do if that doesn't happen. Again, in the 2003 Act, uh, along with many others, I raised the issue of workforce planning. At that time, with the need for more psychiatrists, psychologists, psychiatric nurses, social workers, care workers, mental health officers, and more. And today we face exactly the same problem. We've got a workforce which is not sufficient to deal with existing demands, let alone the new demands placed on them within this bill, as the committee raised in paragraph 73. But I do think it is difficult when the government's own financial memorandum says, states that between 20 to 40 hearing reports will be required in a year. Then COSLA comes up with a figure of 563. And then the minister comes to the committee with an apology and a figure of 15. So we'll go from 30 to 563 to 15. So quite a variation, presiding officer. That not, but not at the moment. Uh, quite a variation there. But this experience alone justifies the need to be clear and unambiguous with the calculations of additional work, because that is the basis on which appropriate staff can and should be recruited, trained and retained for future. Let, let me recognise entirely, yes, we have to be clear with uh, our calculations. I was very frank when I went to the committee. We made a mistake. I uh, fronted that up. I did make the point earlier in intervention to Jim Hume. It's the Mental Welfare Commission that have said that the uh, additional a, a, a responsibility which would result in about 11 uh, reports in the uh, year 13-14. Yes. My point is that the policy memorandum in 2003 under the Labour Lib Dems stated that there were 29 vacancies for psychiatrists and we needed an additional 28 psychiatrists in order to implement the Act. Where is the assessment of the exact need for staff, let alone addressing the current uh, shortages of staff? Others have mentioned the least restrictive alternative. This was a core principle of the 2003 Act, as Malcolm Chisholm, as the Minister, and Richard Simpson both know. My understanding during the passage of that bill was it applied to all restrictions on patients with mental health issues, not just those being held in excessive security. We did discuss the state hospital at Carstairs, and it was my amendment uh, that secured this, but the state hospital had 29 blocked beds at the time and there was a huge need for more medium secure units. I succeeded in gaining the support of all parties in the Parliament for my amendment for more medium secure units, but it was to ensure that mental health patients at that level of high security could be discharged and placed at a level of security appropriate to their needs. On the understanding that a patient can endure excessive security, whether it's a state hospital, a medium secure unit, a low secure unit, and any psychiatric unit at each and every level. And again, the government has not been helpful by failing to bring forward any definition of a qualifying patient and indeed a qualifying hospital, resulting in only patients detained in the state hospital having a right to appeal. Uh, Malcolm Chisholm mentioned the Supreme uh, Court uh, case 2012. But the Scottish Government has to come forward with a proper definition to allow fairness and rights of appeal to all mental health patients in whatever level of excessive security they are being held. Duncan McNeill mentioned the section on nurse holding powers. Well, like Linda Fabiani, I also read the Health Committee report. 
The nurse holding powers, which the Royal College of Nursing states, we don't even know where the proposal came from. It certainly didn't come from nursing. So we're getting more nurse holding powers. The Royal College of Nursing doesn't even know where it came from. And on time for appeal, referral or disposal, again, the Health Committee asks the government for a clear justification that this might perhaps benefit the patient. So it's bad enough that the government doesn't listen to nurses, but I had hoped that they might just listen to patients, but obviously not. And Dr uh, Simpson mentioned, and various, many others, advanced statements. We spent a lot of time on advanced statements in 2003. And I think rather than look at who holds the advanced statements or why, what should be in the advanced statements, why doesn't the government just ask, do patients have confidence that they will be adhered to? Do they think that it's worthwhile writing an advanced statement? Do they think it'll just be overturned at the first whim? Because the patients I talk to do not have confidence in advanced statements. And again, on postnatal depression, uh, the Health Committee waiting for the government to respond uh, on suggestions allowing mothers and fathers. And I pay tribute to a Labour member who's not here today, Bill Butler. It was Bill Butler who secured mothers and babies uh, to be held in hospital together for postnatal depression. And I do hope the government will go that step further. And still no response on the use of force, restraint, or covert medication. And I would like to commend Hunter Watson on his campaign against covert medication, which is reasonably based on the experience in his own family. So, presiding officer, I would just say that we do support the general principles in the bill. I'm sorry that we didn't get the government's response today, uh, but we do recognise there's much more work to do. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for raising those points. Uh, Mary Scanlon, and I would just uh, draw to the Chamber's attention that under Rule 9.7.5, a bill may be amended at Stage 2, uh, a notice of amendment may be given by any member after the completion of Stage 1, if, so if the bill completes Stage 1 today. Also, the Government is not obliged to respond to the Stage 1 report before the Stage 1 debate, but the Government must respond within two months. I hope that's helpful, and we now call on Richard Simpson. Uh, Thank you, minutes, Dr. Presiding Simpson. Officer, for your clarification. I still think the rules are needing to be re-examined. However, I want to deal with things in slightly reverse order and take up the issue of homicides, which uh, is not in the bill. Uh, I've been in discussion with a number of parties after the evidence we had from John Crichton and others about possible amendments covering the, covering the investigation and reporting on homicides and serious assault perpetrated by a person suffering from a mental disorder. I appreciate that the UK confidential inquiry into homicides and suicides is of some help and is very relevant, but the intention of the amendments which I will bring forward, uh, at least for discussion, are to put in primary legislation clarity, consistency and accountability in relation to homicides and serious assault, including attempted murder involving someone with a mental illness, already known to the services. Because at present, this is a highly fragmented system. Currently, out of 137 homicides committed by those with mental illness in the last 10 years, only two have been subject to a report, published report by the Mental Welfare Commission. And based on a freedom of information inquiry by uh, Julian Hendy of the 100 Families Charity, few of these incidents appear to have been subject to adverse incident reviews by boards. Now, this should be compared to England, where out of 576 homicides, there have been 321 reviews. And it's suggested that as many as 25 or even 35 per cent of homicides might have been prevented by different actions. So I think it's an area we need to address, and I will return to it in the bill. Presiding officer, I think this has been a very helpful and uh, useful debate. Uh, we'll all agree this is a relatively modest uh, bill. Um, I think that the, the, the issues uh, are, however, becoming clearer. Um, the, uh, as Bob Doris said, the committee have received uh, a broad spectrum of evidence for which we're very grateful. And the committee, as he said, were very acutely aware of the need to minimize detention or restriction. That is important. And as Jim Hume and George Adam reminded us, Safeguarding the Milan principles are at the core of Parliament's wishes. Uh, and we do need, as uh, I think Linda Fabiana said, to see people in a holistic way. And she also emphasized that uh, 
even giving the impression of sacrificing human rights on the altar of administrative efficiency or convenience of the provider might be damaging. Uh, and I think that was a very important point. Malcolm Chisholm, who was the minister in 2000 in Korea, was clear about the concerns about increased detention and reduction in some times for appeals. All reduction in rights uh, need to be considered extremely carefully. Uh, and I think that the issue that the Inclusion Scotland mentioned, Alison Johnson referred to it, uh, around a learning disability in autism does need to be examined in the context of a review by an expert group, which I hope the Minister will announce within a relatively short period of time, because there are some concerns out there uh, about this particular area covering particularly learning disability in autism, but others in relation to detention. Is the Act now up to date in terms of our thinking? I don't think anyone argues with the principles of the 1999 Milan report. I think they are still relevant today, uh, but there are some concerns about some of the issues still not being addressed. Alison Johnson again referred to asylum seekers, refugees and young people, and I think that that's an important area. A number of speakers, including Nanette Milne, referred to section 25 to 31 of the 2003 Act about local authorities and the need to, to revisit that area and actually have more rigorous inspection by the care inspectorate and HIS uh, to make sure that the, the, the issues in that section of the Act are being properly covered. Uh, one of the areas that we did debate today in considerable detail was the extension of the number of days for a tribunal hearing. Um, I still feel that the blanket extension is something that has to be properly justified and has not yet been justified, and that we need to very carefully consider if it's in the interest of the patient, then we must give the patient rights in relation to that extension rather than making it a blanket one, which may risk... Uh, may just to finish the sentence, may risk problems in relation to ECHR if a seven-week deadline was to become the general and not the exceptional. Bob Doris. In relation to the idea of a blanket extension, do you take on board the point I made during my contribution? There's already an extension protocol there, and if that's not operated as a, as a blanket use, then extending it by a further five working days wouldn't be seen as a blanket use either, and we should get more data of when it's currently used to get more information on that. I think that's a very helpful and valuable point, and I welcome uh, Bob Doris's interventions. A number of speakers spoke about mental health officers and the problems of that workforce, which are a concern. The fact that only 52% have social reports when short-term detention certificates are being made is already a problem and a concern expressed by the Mental Welfare Commission. So whether it's 15 or 500, and uh, you know, I accept the government's uh, very frank uh, admission that the, the, original th situ the original bits under two and four, section 2 and 41 uh, weren't clear that uh, nevertheless I think we need to address the workforce planning and our concerns about the numbers um, undergoing training going down. Nurse holding powers, I think Mary Scanlon said it well, I don't need to add to that. I think it needs to be stopped. I don't think we need that issue. I think it should be dropped from the bill. The appeals against transfer, again, I don't think we've got clear justification for this, and a number of speakers referred to it. Margaret McDougall emphasised uh, that we need to be sure that this is not going to be damaging to patients' rights, and I think uh, we will need to examine that very closely at stage two, and I look forward to greater justification from the government of this decision. Named persons was discussed extensively by Rhoda Grant, Bob Doris, Margaret McDougall, uh, amongst others. And, and Rhoda Grant reminded us of the very complex duties that people take on often uh, are surprised to know exactly what's going to be involved. Um, I think that the question of default uh, is uh, a default person being appointed. I think that really does need to be looked at again. I, I think the, the, at the very least that person should be able to decline. But of course, if they decline, that then again affects the relationship with the patient's uh, relative. So, you know, maybe we, we should look at default very carefully. Rhoda Grant suggested the role of carers need to be clarified, and I agree with that. Uh, we did look briefly at advanced statements, and, uh, and Annette Milne, amongst others, talked about this. Margaret McDougall uh, uh, referred to it, Jim Hume, and others, uh, Bob Doris also. Uh, I think you know, the issues are clear. How do you get good signposting to a secure register in which individuals have confidence that it will be secure, but also that it will then be implemented? And if it, there's a failure of implementation, there's clear reporting to the Mental Welfare Commission, 
and the Mental Welfare Commission do more to support these advanced statements being effective? Because that was an area we debated in 2003. We regard it as being of considerable importance in protecting people's rights and wishes. So I think we need to uh, look at that really very cl uh, closely. Um, the question of appeals against detention in various levels of security was discussed at length. And I, am I got another 20 seconds? Yes, 20 Thank you. seconds. Um, the appeal against detention. We need to look at the sort of low secure units as well as medium secure. We need to get that right, as we do in terms of transfer, allowing transfer back, uh, and the appeal, appeals against that. And also low secure units in various settings. Um, so, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I will finish on this one issue, and that's uh, Linda Fabiana mentioned, and that's advocacy. This is a duty at the moment that is not fully extended to everyone. The time has come for a right of advocacy to be available to anyone with a mental illness uh, problem, and that should be enshrined in this Act. Many thanks. I now call on Minister Jamie Hepburn to wind up the debate. Minister, you have until 4.59. Thank you very much, President Officer. And can I begin by saying I'm very grateful to uh, members across the Chamber for uh, their contributions to what uh, Richardson has said, and I agree has been uh, a very useful uh, debate. It's very encouraging to hear the passion and commitment uh, from so many members to ensure that our mental health legislation works as well as possible for service users as well as for those supporting uh, service users and providing uh, care to them within uh, the system. I I'll uh, reflect on uh, some of the aspects raised uh, during the debate. I I'm afraid it will only be some. This has been a very uh, wide-ranging uh, debate. What I will uh, say is I will endeavour to ensure uh, that those areas I do not respond to uh, in closing here in summation it will be picked up on in the Scottish Government's response to the committee report. And having mentioned that, I very much recognise the perspective that has been expressed by many that it would have been better to have had the uh, response in advance of this debate. The President Officer set out the uh, standing orders around these matters. I would observe the standing orders of this panel aren't my sole responsibility. They are uh, the responsibility of us uh, collectively. But uh, I will endeavour to uh, get that response finalised as quickly as, uh, as possible, including uh, what has been raised in this stage one uh, debate. And I'll very much I'll, I'll take on board uh, this perspective that has been expressed uh, going forward in regards to my uh, ministerial role in relation to future uh, legislation, uh, President Officer. Touching on the issue of the extension of uh, short-term uh, detention certificates from five to uh, ten days until an application uh, is determined, uh, Duncan McNeill raised this uh, early on about the issue of uh, monitoring this. I could say to him we are working very closely uh, with the tribunal to get further information to discuss how this uh, issue would be uh, monitored. I can say that any changes uh, within uh, the bill will be uh, accompanied by uh, revised guidance and the Code of Practice rules will reflect uh, the government's policy that this should be in line with the principle of loose restriction and that the uh, process should operate in the service user's interest. Dr Simpson offered uh, some suggestions about how he might seek to amend uh, the bill at stage two. I can say to uh, Dr Simpson, if, uh, should he wish to, I'd be very happy to meet with him to discuss uh, that and indeed any uh, other area I'll happily consider what he is uh, suggesting. Turning to the issue of uh, appeals against uh, excessive uh, security, the government is developing uh, regulations uh, in this uh, area and is committed to providing the Health and Sport Committee with uh, draft regulations during the passage of the bill so that they can adequately uh, assess them. We want to uh, provide a, a right of appeal for uh, patients uh, and certainly in medium secure settings addressing this would fully deliver the Milan Re Committee's recommendation that pa patients should have a right of appeal to be transferred in state hospital or a medium secure facility to conditions of lower uh, security. I do uh, appreciate that there continue to be concerns from some stakeholders that it is important uh, uh, about the uh, area more generally. It is important that we get the balance right on what is a complex uh, matter and be ha very happy to engage with stakeholders and members in relation to that. I should say uh, Bob Doris uh, made a suggestion of looking at the amount of uh, time a person might have to wait for a tribunal hearing as a way of dealing uh, with these matters. I appreciate that suggestion. It's innovative. We'd be very happy to uh, look at this. I, and I would uh, generally make the point that members should be assured we are very carefully uh, looking at this matter because we have to. Jim Hume uh, and others made the point there has been a Supreme uh, Court ruling. We have to put uh, provisions for appeals in place. It is a necessity that we do so. I would observe, though, President Officer, the Supreme Court was not uh, specific about what those uh, provision, provisions should be. 
Uh, Malcolm Chisholm, I think, and others made the point that the patient who brought forward the challenge was held in conditions of a low, a secure setting, but the Supreme Court did not uh, make the judgment uh, based on the appellant's uh, level of uh, secure uh, accommodation directly. Uh, but we must, uh, of course, get uh, these arrangements in place. I'll be happy to look at suggestions for the report, of course, briefly. Yes. yes, can I just ask if the Minister agrees that a patient can be held in excessive security, which may be the state hospital, or it may be a low level of security, but it can still be considered excessive? Well, I, I think we need to very carefully consider it because I suppose we need to determine who considers it to be excessive. Is it uh, the patient or could it be uh, an outside uh, 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 person? So I, I suppose I just make the point uh, generally we are looking at this very uh, carefully and uh, should members care to bring forward suggestions as Mr Doris uh, has done then we will very carefully consider what they uh, have to say. Turning to the issue of the nurses uh, holding power, uh, President Officer, I, I would like to emphasise that this is not uh, about administrative uh, efficiency or making uh, things uh, easier. It, it's really about providing uh, clarity for service users about the maximum amount of time uh, they can be held for, uh, uh, as well as the purpose of uh, that detention. And I would also observe that I'm not particularly clear that this is a new power, particularly as has been suggested. Under the Bill's proposals, as under existing uh, legislation, no patient can be held for any longer than three hours under these provisions. And uh, actually, I am not uh, convinced that it is as clear as it could be under the current uh, legislation that a, a patient could be held uh, for three hours. Uh, obviously, the standard is two, and it can be extended to three hours, whereas this would be uh, clearer from the outset. And of course, the power will be accompanied by clear guidance in the Code of Practice, which will make it uh, clear that it should be used in line with the principle of least restriction and with the uh, guidance on reporting to the Mental Welfare Commission. And the provision uh, will be make it clear that uh, the power is for up to three hours and can be uh, for the purpose of a medical uh, examination. Uh, turning to the issue of uh, named uh, persons, uh, President Officer, I recognise uh, the concerns about the uh, default position and uh, the lack of appetite there seems to be. I, I can say uh, to the Chamber I am currently minded to propose an amendment uh, to remove this. We want to do this in a way to make sure that this does not damage, uh, disadvantage sorry, uh, the most uh, vulnerable uh, service units and uh, exploring how we uh, strike uh, the right uh, balance. Uh, turning to the issue of uh, the registration of uh, advanced statements, uh, President Officer, these uh, provisions, I believe, uh, strengthen uh, the position of advanced statements uh, uh, by ensuring that they are held in medical uh, records. Officials, uh, Scottish Government officials are working with the Mental Welfare Commission and other stakeholders to ensure that concerns around privacy and confidentiality will be met. Advanced statements will be held in line with the strict controls and other uh, patient information held by the Commission. I think it is important uh, to uh, emphasise that they already keep personal uh, data. It is not uh, new for them. And the Commission has strict uh, data protection protocols in place to ensure that records are accessed, accessed lawfully and appropriately. Uh, and Richard Simpson made the point that Really, these statements should be available 24-7. Uh, Annette Milne talked of having quick access uh, to these uh, statements. Uh, George Adam also said that uh, there was important, uh, uh, this was an important change to make the uh, system more effective. I think we can strike the right balance uh, between uh, the need for privacy and these requirements for uh, quick and 24-7 uh, uh, um, access to these uh, statements. I also very much agree with the uh, committee's belief that more can be done to promote advanced statements. I want to make sure uh, that that is done in the most meaningful way, which has the uh, strongest impact. And uh, in this uh, case, I'm not convinced that using legislation would necessarily uh, achieve this uh, in of itself. Uh, instead, I'm uh, concerned how this can be done uh, out with legislation, perhaps through specific and uh, targeted guidance. But if constructive uh, amendments come forward uh, to place in the face of all that, I will, of course, uh, give that uh, active consideration. Turn to the issue of uh, advocacy and awareness of uh, patients' rights. Mary Scanlon made the very reasonable point, of course, that there isn't a particular, uh, 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 isn't particularly effective if a person has rights if they don't know about them. I very much agree uh, with that uh, sentiment. As part of the implementation of this bill, we will update our guidance leaflets uh, for users. The government will work closely with stakeholders in doing this and take their views on how to promote awareness uh, of rights through uh, this work. In terms of advocacy, there is a strong duty in the Act on the right to advocacy. I recognise uh, that there are calls for ensuring uh, the uh, 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 adequate provision of advocacy. I am a very strong believer in advocacy. Office. I believe it greatly empowers uh, people. I have noted calls for uh, greater uh, monitoring and in discussion with 
uh, and we're in discussions with relevant organisations about how best to do this. But again, I'm uh, not necessarily convinced legislation is required to do this, but also, uh, uh, as I've said before, if uh, members want to bring forward an amendment, then I will, of course, uh, happily uh, consider that. As I feared, uh, President Officer, time uh, does not uh, particularly allow me to cover uh, every issue. So let me uh, close by uh, saying I recognise that the bill, uh, 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 as finished, uh, 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 as presented rather, it uh, might not be the final article. Bob Doris mentioned he looks forward to engaging constructively about amending the bill at stage two. I welcome that approach. It is the approach I will take. Uh, and it's one I hope we'll all take. I believe it's the approach that professionals, patients and public expect us to take to ensure we have the most effective system to support those with an identified mental health disorder. And I look forward to continuing that work at stage two, President Officer. Many thanks. And that concludes the debate on stage one of the Mental Health Scotland Bill. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business which is consideration of motion number 12285 in the name of John Swinney on the financial resolution for the Mental Health Scotland Bill. And I call on Jamie Hepburn to move the motion. Or Mr Swinney. <laughs> Thank you. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next question... The next item of business is consideration of three parliamentary bureau motions, and I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion numbers 12498, 12499, and 12602 on approval of SSIs. Moved on block. Thank you. The question on these motions will be put at decision time, to which we now come. And there are six questions to be put as a result of today's business. And the first question is that motion number 12623 in the name of John Swinney on the Local Government Finance Scotland Amendment Order 2015 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. Please cast your vote now. The result of the vote on motion number 12623 in the name of John Swinney is yes, 95, no, 5. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion number 12624 in the name of Jamie Hepburn on the Mental Health Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Thank you. And We'll move to the next item of business, which is quest the third question. And that is that the motion 12285 in the name of John Swinney on the financial resolution for the M for Mental Health Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you very much. The next question is that motion 12498 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on the land and building transaction tax tax rates and tax ban Scotland order be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not. There will therefore be a division. Please cast your votes now. Result of the vote on motion number 12498 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick is yes, 89, no, 11. There were no abstentions, and the motion is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion number 12499 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on the land and building transaction tax sub sale development relief and multiple dwellings relief Scotland order 
be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Thank you very much. And then the next question is that motion 12602 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on the National Bus Travel Concession Scheme for Older and Disabled Persons Scotland Amendment Order be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. And that concludes decision time and I now close this meeting of Parliament. Thank you. Thank you.